Hey, everybody. It is your good friend, Dr. David Proden, the safety doc from down here in the North Star Recording Studio, where it is a brisk 62 degrees. And it was a cold one last night. I did the live show from out on the track. For those of you following along with me on those 20 laps in the breezy, chilly wind. Uh, but today, we are going to be talking about teacher burnout crisis. And this is quite a headline because uh, I was searching for articles today and found more and more articles about schools issuing days off for teachers and students because of burnout. Um, but I'm gonna tell you why I don't think that is the solution and actually how it's going to compound the issues of staff burnout. But first I have my timer. And uh, what I'm going to do here is, is set at 75 minutes. So I want to keep the show around that 75 minute range. So I'm going to start our timer here. And there we go. All right. Um, first of all, thank you for tuning in to the safety doc. And if you, hey, it's one. It is one. It's Andrew. It's Moose Gal Corner. It's homeschool time. Awesome. Awesome. All right. California, Illinois. Whoa. Um, what, um, first of all, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please subscribe. There are two shows of the Safety Doc, Monday nights, 8.15, and also Friday mornings at 9 a.m. Central. And Friday mornings are Face Validity Fridays, where we go through headlines, go through documents, official releases of information, and then we're like, does this make sense? <laughs> From Face Validity, is this what we're seeing? Oh, there's only a 2% increase in inflation yet, you know, fill up our gas tank and it's $7.04. So we're going to keep honing um, face validity skills on Friday and just try to match is face validity getting um, wilder and wilder with headlines and reports versus what we're actually authentically observing when we go out into our environments. Um, today, teacher burnout crisis. So a little background on me. Um, I've worked in education for more than 25 years as a teacher and as an administrator and a consultant, also as an instructor of um, university courses. So I instruct three university courses per year to aspiring school leaders. So this is a topic I know quite a bit about, right? Also wrote the book, School of Errors, Rethinking School Safety in America. So this is not much of a bird walk for me to get into this. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to frame what's happening right now. This teacher burnout crisis, kind of what the contemporary re response, the popular response is to this at the moment. And then five ways that this could be improved, um, within a relatively short amount of time, if these five things were followed and some of them that I'm going to present are going to be kind of novel, right? And none of them have to do with throwing more money into this. Um, and I'll tell you why. So, well, let's just let's just talk about teacher uh, burnout crisis. So, um, it was Friday, November twelfth, two thousand twenty-one. Classes were canceled for many public school districts in North Carolina across the state, shutting it down. The intended purpose of that motion was to offer a mental health day for teachers and students experiencing burnout from the pandemic and the cumulative stress of contemporary education. So basically, hey, we sense administration, I guess, um, politicians, we sense people um, are, are burned out. Teachers are burned out, administrators, um, students, so we're going to just okay this, this day off. I don't know if it's with pay, I'm guessing it is. <laughs> but this is becoming frequent um, to do a search for a mental health day, days off, schools building in schedules, where students, for example, can take five, quote, mental health days without question, um, staff being able to take mental health days. Now, I want to stop at this point and say, I'm not against mental health, obviously not. Um, but to simply say you can take a day off or, you know, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll have some days built in the calendar where we won't have school um, so you can address mental health. Well, that's that's not likely, right? Um, it's just it, taking a, a day away doesn't improve mental health. Um, so any of us listening to this too as a face validity, this sounds 
good, right? You can sell us as being compassionate, having empathy for teachers and, and students. But um, but yeah, just, just saying, oh, we're going to have a day away uh, c- compounds a lot of issues. So I think it's very misleading to just say we're going to do to do this day away. So um, let's go over here and give a shout out to the chat. Uh, Moose Gal, uh, Juan, Zippy, dun, dun, dun. hey, Zippy, um, homeschool. And um, all right, Zippy. And we got Andrew. So all right, it's happening. Good. Um, so so Zippy put um, mental health is an inch wide and a university, which it is. And I addressed that in my 2019 PBS presentation. That was mental health for students saying that, oh, like that is extremely vague, like what constitutes mental health, what doesn't. Um, and that, you know, t- there, there needs to be a formal um, process to assess where somebody is at. How do, what are the parameters for mental health? And then how do you match up that profile then with a treatment? And is a treatment just a day away? Or if it's a day away and, you know, you're, you're taking a walk that day or watching a movie, is that really is that mental health. So what's getting lumped into all of this for mental health is is just, you know, really just taking um, a day away from from the the school system, right? Um, And imagine, imagine truck drivers, right? Over the road drivers. And it's like been a crazy, you know, crazy couple of weeks for them. And you're like, hey, you don't, the next, the next Thursday. And then like two weeks after that, the following Tuesday, you don't have to work those days. So, you know, what would be the response? Well, um, and you're still get paid. Okay. The thing is, though, like the freight still needs to get moved. You just get further behind, right? It's not that the whole system adjusts for this. And I think that's a big part that's missing in this. So I wrote, what happens on mental health days? So I actually did this blog post already. I don't have it up, but I have it ready to go. So this will all be out tomorrow. What happens on mental health days? So staff and students are typically given... <laughs> vague guidance. So they're just said, you know, chill out for this day, chill out tomorrow. Um, and you know, it's kind of it, right? It's, it's not a specific program or anything. And again, if you just have a day away or a couple days away, it's, it's this whole thought that this has this magical therapeutic effect of, because you're just not in school is ridiculous. It, that doesn't make any sense, um, whatsoever. But again, it's badged right now as, as, oh, this is very necessary. And in fact, like I'm going to point this out, it's actually uh, destroying routines. I mean, the school calendar and, and kids counting on, on a, some, some predictability in their school schedule, especially after last year when some schools you know, completely shut down um, in April and, and some for the rest of the year, to now you know, kind of jostle with kids' schedules and toggle and stuff like that, um, you know, instead of, and, and what does that mean for parents? And, and even, you know, if you're a teacher, what does that mean for you? Because like, you're still accountable for teaching, uh, you know, curriculum, you're still accountable for your students' state test scores, for students with disabilities, for meeting IEP or individualized education plan um, minutes and things like that. So just to say, oh, we're going to take this day off for mental health has massive implications in all of these things. So again, what, what happens? So I, you know, I instruct university students who are currently teachers or administrators. And I ask, um, I, you know, I ask them this question. So when you have a day off there, the district declares a mental health day, right? It's not a state usually doing this, like the North Carolina, it's usually like a district will, will kind of declare this a day or a couple of days. Um, so, so what is, what do you do during those days? And what they tell me is I work, (laughs) I catch up on work. Um, I'm, but they're not, um, they're not doing non-work things. They're just maybe not at school, but they're still doing work things. Um, so it's, again, it's, it's not that there is, you know, some very defined program that, uh, you know, that staff or students enter, um, during this time off that specifically addresses. I mean, it's, it's imagine like if you go to the gym to work out, if you go to the gym, you know, someone is going to do an assessment of your, you know, um, what you can lift, you know, how long you can can run on a treadmill and all of these things and all the baseline. And they'll, they'll have a plan, like a, fit, a, a fitness coach, right? Would have a plan. So you'd come in and they'd say, okay, like once you do like this many reps and, uh, you know, 
want you to do um, four minutes over on the treadmill and a break and then like four more minutes. And so like they would have this plan put together and then ultimately you'd, you'd be able to know your baseline and be able to see a change from baseline. Anybody that goes to the gym, like Zippy, he's a gym animal. He's always at the gym. He's always texting me. He's like, hey, I'm at the gym. And I'm like, he's, you know, guys, just he's dedicated. Uh, so um, same with Juan in martial, martial arts. Um, Andrew um, in jujitsu. So and uh, ping pong, but uh, moose gal corners. So let me um, let me bring this one up. So, um, well, Andrew, wrote, if the workplace is unbearable, taking one day off won't solve the problem, right? It just it doesn't, right? It just gets you away for a day that you're thinking about it, and now you're further behind typically in what you have to do or what you have to deal with at work. Um, so. Right. It's, it's not, it's not a remedy. Anybody in any job anywhere knows that, right? <laughs> um, what does taking time off? This is Moose Gal's corner. What's taking time off from work look like when you have a remote job? I am all for the, taking mental health breaks, but it has to be necessary for individuals to not just any day. This is a good point um, because remote, uh, right? Remote workers, what is, what does it mean? And I, ideally it would mean that you're not logging in and accessing your your work so i mean i i did remote consulting uh during much of 2020 i didn't take any mental health days um but there were places where i consulted where they had days off for mental health so then on those days i wasn't i wasn't consulting <laughs> those days i just i didn't work i just had so many days and i just kind of shifted shift them around because i wasn't that wasn't a full-time thing but um but yeah, so I guess on, on remote, and this is a, this is a good point you brought up here, a Muscal Corner. There's this thing called Parkinson's Law, which I'll get into in a little bit. It's in my notes, um, where you know if you're a remote worker, it is basically you're not logging in that day. So um, because that's a tendency, right? You're always kind of logged in. You're always you're always accessing. But it's a good question. What does it look like? Yeah, uh, you know, from a contract standpoint of you know logging in so many hours versus getting so much work done, but. So, um, so let's, let's take a look. So what happened? So I talked to, to, you know, these, these students in my class who are educators and they're like, yeah, we, we, and I said, do you have anything formal? And they're like, well, sometimes, you know, there'll be an email coming out and say, we you know, listen to relaxing music or get out and take a walk or do yoga or, you know, watch a movie or something like that, which is all advice that any of us could give to anybody. <laughs> You know, if, if, if we perceive that there's, that's not a program, right? That has, has no therapeutic value to it. If it did, just think how Netflix would be advertising right now. <laughs> I mean, that would be like the biggest thing ever of saying, hey, like this is a benefit to your mental health. Like tune in to, yeah, it and uh, Smoking the Bandit um, part four. So, so this isn't, this is being disguised as, as this therapeutic approach. And again, I get the, the empathy standpoint and it's like, we feel like we're doing something, but um, again, you know, this, so imagine now you're a teacher and you put your lesson together and your kids are already behind because 2020 was just wacky, you know, with kids um, going remote, some schools just ending early altogether, toggling of hybrid, um, versus in person and, and all of that stuff. And if you're a teacher and you know you have five, you have a lesson you're going to instruct in five days. And it's about like the awesomeness of podcast. And here's the safety app pack. We're gonna we're gonna list, we're gonna learn how to do podcasting in five days. And suddenly, you know, like your your district says, well, uh, Wednesday we're not going to have school. That's a mental health day for everybody. And you're like, well, oh, okay. So like what I just planned for five days, now I've got to condense that into four days or I have to cut it by 20%. So I have to cut content, right? You have to cut content out if you're not adding days. If you just have, typically a school schedule is 180 days of student contact, meaning like in-person or virtual. And then there's some professional development days. And then there's, of course, breaks and summer stuff like that. But like 180 days. So you start knocking a few of these days out that you're not replacing, that you're not adding back in. You're, you're cutting content out, right? You're cutting content out for students who are already behind, staff who are already behind. So... You know, they're, they're not like, yay. I mean, honestly, they're like, I want to get this stuff addressed. And part of it is we have state assessments. You know, states do this and gets led into the feds and the feds rank the states and their performance. They're like, you know, I've got students now that are going to lose a day of instruction, right? So 
this is this this isn't good. This isn't good. Um, it's it's really throwing, you know, teachers uh, teachers for a loop, and then also families, right? Because families are like, well, I have, I have to stay home this day, or I have to get childcare this day. So, um, it's um, do you even lift the buildings? So, I don't know. It depends how strong you are. Uh, <laughs> Zippy wrote, or can't be dishonest people pushing to get an extra paid day off. I think one's, one's coming. I think what's happening now is it's just becoming popular. It A few districts started to do this, and then like the media covered it. And it's badged right now as, as kids need time off and teachers. But, you know, this whole question like extends everywhere, right, Juan? Like it could extend, you know, to the work that you do or over the road, you know, truck drivers or people working at nursing. I mean, all, all of these things, I don't think it, right. Why does it, why is the spotlight on, you know, teachers and why is it, why is it on K-12 education when, you know, this from, from a real thoughtful perspective, like I said, it knocks out lesson it, instruction time. You're having to cut stuff out um, and you're, you're jostling with kids routines um, you're, you're jostling with parents, uh, schedules. So, um, yeah, but again, it's, it's, these articles are all very positive, um, in, in the news and they're all covered in this glowing way of mental health and mental health. It's the buzzword and it is a buzzword that is being overused and it's being like a mile wide inch deep, kind of what Zippy was saying. Um, so it is our friend Bacon Maldito, shout out to Inglewood, California. So Bacon was with me last night on my my laps around the track. Um, so I did, I did a live stream last night impromptu 11 o'clock PM at night central time. And, uh, I have a, a track next in next to high school, a couple blocks from me. So sometimes I go out there, um, late at night, usually kind of not as late as last night and I'll, I'll walk, um, you know, just for fitness. Right. And, um, and last night I was like, I'm going to try to do like a live stream, which is crazy because it's like, you know, dark. <laughs> and I just got a flashlight in one hand and a camera in another. And it's, you know, like freezing weather and I've got gloves on. And, you know, the whole thing was just kind of just an experiment. But I'm like, oh, it's got some potential, you know, if there was daylight and, and uh, you know, stuff like that. Um, but but it was it was it was fun to try that out, um, trying to, to experiment a little bit with the technology. Like I said, this show will air. 8 15 monday nights and then also nine o'clock a.m on fridays is the second version of this which is the face validity fridays um so let's see we have um zippy wrote rather than doubling pay i wonder if doubling teachers would help load balance hell hire a sub to e-learn uh but they get paid half as much and they get sent to where the system needs are okay so zippy so this is one of the things that is being considered by some districts of, of should we increase pay? Now, the thing is like, for, even if you doubled the pay, I think you would retain teachers, but you'd retain burned out teachers. Um, I, I I don't think doubling pay would, would make actually that big of a difference. Now, what you said here about hiring subs and having them kind of ready to go and stuff, that's a great idea. And there's no subs out there. I mean, there's a teacher, there's been a teacher shortage even before the pandemic. So now you compound and, you know, the, the bus drivers are coming in and they're being, you know, paid to be subs and stuff like that. So, so like, you've got a really good framework, um, with this and a framework that back when this, this situ the situation wasn't as stressed as it is now, you know, back before 2020 actually <laughs> would have been really thoughtful for, for schools to do this model, um, so Zibby brings up a good point. Like, can we just pay more money with this, with this solve it? And, and it's the research shows us that paying more money either to educators or in different professions where people feel they're stressed out and they're, they're burned out and, and the, and the same thing in mil, in the military. So I'll get into this a little bit as I get through the five points, the studies of combat pay, like that didn't combat pay wasn't a big incentive to stay at the front lines at all. Um, it was more being rotated out um, and, and having a ample amount of time off um, and then also being recognized this kind of badging system and, and uh, the infantry in World War I doing the blue shoulder patches. Um, so, you know, those are some things that were effective, but yeah, increasing um, uh, paid actually didn't make much of an impact. And again, I don't like 
where I'm at, some educators are getting pretty big bonuses to hop from district to district, but they're not staying where they go. They'll take the money and then a couple of years later, they'll like move somewhere else because they know they can kind of play free agent and put district against district right now. So one, mental, we're talking mental health days. If we just paid more, would that, um, would that cut down on teacher burnout, things like that? Probably not. Um, let's go over to um, Muska. It'll be better if the HR manual states that individuals can take personal paid time off for mental health. So yeah, so so this this is a really cogent point, you know, that you made. Um, that's not part of typical like HR protocols at this point. So these are kind of add-ons, right? Like nobody had this in their contracts and or collective bargaining for states that have that or something. Um, so these are, this is all kind of bolted on afterwards of saying, oh, like, you know, now we're going to introduce these mental health days when no one has really talked about what does that really mean other than just having a day off or like somebody scrambling and, and downloading a couple things off the web. And they're like, okay, you know, here's a, here's a list I got and listen to a different radio station, you know, take a walk, um, you know, watch something on TV, all of those things like be in the sun, you know, obviously like any of us could come up with this list. Zippy, I bet you could come up with a list of like 20 items and then Juan could add to it and then Bacon could add to it. Um, and so, so yeah, this is a good point. And as, as you said, Muscal, um, the part is this has to be formal, right? It's just not as simple as taking a day off. If that was the case, um, we would have been there long ago. Like this would have been the solution for every, you know, every work setting, right? Hey, like it's stressed right now. So just like you take a day off or two days off. And the point is like, then you're coming back to the same situation. The situation doesn't change, right? The situation, because you're not there, the situation doesn't change. It's in schools, it's still educating kids. It's still trying to make up for lost time. It's still assessments. It's still a certain amount of instruction in your curriculum that you have to get accomplished. Like that's being, that does, that's static, right? That's there. So just like exiting from that and coming back, it's like a farmer, like leaving your farm, right? So, um, you know, I'm going to take two days away from my farm and you come back and then it's like, whoa, like my cows haven't been milked and, you know, I haven't been out in the fields and this, this harvesting needed to happen. And then, you know, you could go through all these things like that, that all remains like that doesn't simmer down at all. You know, that's the thing is, is this thought of like, if you take the students and staff out of the situation, like the situation simmers down, the rheostat turns down, but that's not the case. You just come back and now you come back and you have to do more right in less time so it just adds to this where everybody like works up again and then it's like whoa we need break because everybody's you know everybody's frazzled everybody's freaking out um muscal said i keep reading articles that people are leaving the education profession in the usa so yeah yeah um when i wrote school of heirs um retention for teachers you know was three to five years administrators two to three years and we know that's there aren't as many uh, people coming into teaching for the profession and there are more people retiring. So, um, so yeah, the profession is in, in right now, I mean, just think about the starting wages that are being offered at, you know, um, manufacturing jobs and, and the benefits and things like that. So there's much more competition where, you know, in the past teaching, you know, had the appeal of, of, you know, for example, uh, summer's off, you know, weekends. And th yes, I know teachers work and things like that, but, but, you know, that has, it, that has been, you know, really offset now, but I think, you know, anybody who wants to, to work, there's jobs out there for you to work. Um, so let's go out to a Zippy K-12 seems to be the worst paid in comparison to the workload. I think so. Um, you know, teachers get these, the, here's the thing with K-12, right? So K-12 education is this, this gigantic, let's take a, a ship, okay? It's this gigantic ship. And, uh, you know, like 100 years ago, it was, you know, uh, you marveled at it. And you're like, whoa, like, I really appreciate, like, everything that went into this. I mean, just imagine, you know, like, school uh, buildings and the fact of, of you know, coming in and, and, you know, kids would learn how to read, how to write these skill sets. You kind of marvel at this thing. And then suddenly like all of these barnacles, you know, start to appear on the ship and more and more you're passing, uh, you know, more, more bills, more initiatives. And, and that's the thing, like 
there's too much on it. Like you, you, it's to the point where the barnacles are sinking the ship, right? You can't do all of these things. The schools can't be everything to everybody. They kind of be, become this social marketplace, this, this outlet for all of these, these agendas. Um, so, you know, it's, so that's changed significantly in schools, right? If you, you come in all the things that you're expected to, to teach, um, from academics to social emotional, uh, programs and, and it's, it's just, um, it is a lot. <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, like I said, I interface and then all the, all of the assessments and all of, you know, then the grading coming out and these things in the time frame. and teachers don't have a lot of professional development time. So, you know, you might have between four and eight days a year where you're covering everything from bloodborne pathogens to your curriculum to uh, school safety, you know, intruder and fire drill and, and all of this stuff and how to use the, the grading system and all of that. Um, it's not a lot of time for professional development. And anybody that comes on board during the year, um, induction just doesn't exist. It's kind of like learn from the person over there. Um, hey, there's a good friend, B3 Outdoors. So I hope you're sub to this channel. I've seen you out there, buddy. Hey, do you think there should be cameras in classrooms for parents to watch? That's a great question. That's a great question. Um, and I think now, right, because kids are going from home to remote more often, um, I'm not against this. I think the technology is there. And even as a university instructor, um, to be to to be recorded and to have that archive of instruction, not as evaluative, right? Everybody will go there. Well, it shouldn't be done because it's evaluative, but I think it becomes a resource, right? Especially when the parent is trying to help their child um, that they can then, you know, go back to if there's a certain part when there's a unit delivered or something. Now there's like complications in this B3 um, because the companies that sell curriculums to schools will say, well, you can't like publicly share this curriculum because, you know, you've just bought this for tens of thousands of dollars from us and, you know, it can't be aired over the web you know, because this is proprietary information, but, um, yes. And I, and I would say, I think this is, is a good idea. Um, now again, you're going to say, oh, confidentiality and things like that. Yeah. So maybe, you know, I don't know, is it something where, um, it's video, but it's, it's, you know, only on the teacher there's, there's audio or some, market. but I, I look at this and say, there, there are a lot of times when, a teacher wishes they had that archive of what was being instructed. It was a, that's a benefit of um, the smart boards that teachers do. They actually can just download everything that they wrote on the smart board and stuff and put it in like a Google classroom file. And then the kids have it and the teachers have it. So, so yeah, that's a good, that's a good one. That's that could, that'll actually probably come up in a case study that I'll write for a future class. Um, so let me get, so let me get to the, keep These are great questions. So thank you so much. Um, and thank you for smashing that like button uh, 16 times. That is um, that is some uh, crazy, crazy awesome stuff. So that means um, right here. So dun, 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 dun. subscribe, thumbs up, dun, 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 do solid air. Hey, we're almost up to 600 subscribers, which I appreciate. I mean, we are up over 100 subscribers on this channel in the last 28 days. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so again, we talked about these mental health days. You're gonna you see them on the news, you read them in the paper, and the question is like, so what happens? It's really just a day away from a day away from school. There's nothing specifically going on. So it disrupts routines. I wrote about the Taurus in School of Airs of it's how how important it is for people to have routines, right? And especially if you're a kid, like routines are very very important for kids. And when you toss them out of a routine, kids have a hard time then. Um, kind of advancing, like it's almost this whirlpool. And I wrote about that in the philosophy of information. Like when you take routines away from kids, they they don't kind of move down the river. They just kind of stay in this whirlpool and go around and around. We're adults. If you take away routines, they, they can still break out of the whirlpool and figure out how to kind of like move on. But it's not the same for kids. So this is, this is like, there's bad science behind this, right? <laughs> if you actually you know, tried to to make an argument from a scientific standpoint for taking a day off of school for mental health, that argument falls flat. So here are five ways that you can solve teacher burnout. So five ways. Um, the first thing is there's a thing called Parkinson's law. And Parkinson's law states that um, it's kind of this informal thing. Let's say that I had eight hours to paint this wall in back of me. All right. This paneling is going to be gone. I'm going to paint it and I have eight hours. 
And really, like, it only takes, it's only going to take me two hours to paint that. It's not that big of a wall. And, you know, I'm not that picky of a painter. So it would um, take me two hours, but I have eight hours to paint it. So I'm likely going to take eight hours. I'm like, I'll make the job fit the eight hours. So that's kind of this Parkinson's law. But there's another part of Parkinson's law. This is like from the 1940s. And it, it basically says, you know, humans function really well when, they, when they're doing a task, when there's a defined start and end of the task. So think about like work before the pandemic, you know, for a lot of us, you got up, you got your coffee, you know, and you get in your car and you're driving to work. So these are all like definite markers that start your work day. You get to work, da, 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 turn on your computer, fire things up. That's your start, this process to start. And then at the end, it's power everything down, get back to your car, crank up the tunes, head back home. So there's this end, right? Of, of this end routine, the start routine, very well defined. So when when we go, um, so so again, humans function very well in this. And uh, when when schools went to the remote teaching, this whole thing of Parkinson's law was pretty much out the window. Um, like you know, teachers would log in at night, or if a parent you know said, "Hey, like I, I work during the day, but like." I can go on at six o'clock at night and touch base with you or my, you know, my kid and I can be on at six 30. Like teachers were adjusting. And so suddenly, as you had pointed out before, like the school day no longer is eight to three. It's kind of like just continuous. Like it just goes on and a parent might be emailing at 11 at night and they expect that you're going to respond to that because you better respond before, you know, they, they go to work tomorrow or if they're leaving the house or if they're logging into their zoom, wherever their job is. So this whole thing of Parkinson's law just got messed up. It got messed up for kids too. Like kids were used to getting up in the morning and going to school, walking to school or getting on a bus or getting in a car and getting dropped off. So obey Parkinson's law. So that's the first thing is the teaching model right here is um, it's, it's, it's completely messed up. So what schools did is they're like, oh, we don't want to lose the online aspect of teaching because what if we have to go back to remote? So let's keep a foot over in that camp. So teachers, here's the deal. Like you are going to teach in the classroom, but I want you to maintain this hybrid option, right? So if some kids have, still want to stay home, they'll still count for our enrollment, right? Um, so you're going to do these two things. Suddenly, it's like, that's a lot to plan for. Like, how do you, you know, you teach your face-to-face -face lesson and then to think you're just going to turn that face-to-face -face lesson into a remote lesson, that's different. I teach university courses in person in the fall. I teach them online in spring. Completely different to prepare for those and to instruct those. And actually, I think the online courses take me more time than the in-person courses. Um, and I also have to be much more, um, you know, uh, provide much more supplemental information, visuals and diagrams and stuff like that when I'm using or when I'm doing um, online because I can't in the moment kind of read what people are, are doing and, and adjust. So I just have to really overtly get the point across. So anyway, imagine if you're a teacher Three years ago, you were preparing to teach your third grade class or your, you know, high school language arts classes or whatever in person, all right? And now you're being told, I want you to do this in person. And not want you, you're going to do this in person. Plus, you also need to do this section that's online for the kids that aren't here. Or maybe the kids that are here two days a week and they're home three days a week. So you get you, all these combinations come up. And the reason schools do this right, is because they're catering to the parents. It's not in the best interest of the teachers to do this. This is burning out teachers. They, they're having to do more planning than ever and kind of individualize. Imagine you got 20, 30 kids in a classroom. You're individualizing all of this out to times. Maybe this kid is going to, yeah, be at four o'clock, their parent can log in. Or maybe, you know, um, I'm going to have to check in the, the morning and get some stuff out to this kid. Or this kid's only here on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So, you know, Wednesdays, I've got to make an um, online version for them. I mean, all of this stuff is happening. And here's here's what caused this to happen. Administrators, at the start of the year, they sent out emails. They sent out surveys to parents. And they said, oh, parents, like, what do you want for the return of the school year? And this is a really bad move. Because of uh, you don't leave these decisions up to parents. You just, you have to make this as a board of education and an administrator. You don't, you know, it's in... And so basically parents would say, well, it'd be great like if we had the option to do online because parents are thinking, you know, what if, yeah, we have increased numbers of, of uh, pandemic 
cases in the school and, and, you know, then my kid can stay home. They're already kind of used to what's going on or what, I mean, so, so this was a bad, and districts got backed into a corner because parents didn't respond with, I want, you know, a hundred percent in person. They were like, oh, I want this and I want this. And the way that the schools set themselves up for that was then, okay, if, if we don't comply with this, right, if I'm in school and I'm saying we're only doing in-person, I might lose 10, 15% of my students to a district that is, has an online component. Well, schools get paid by the student and they get paid about $15,000 here in my state. Um, so suddenly you have 10, 15% of your students or more that leave for a virtual option, you're in big trouble. So, so yeah, so this Parkinson's law start day, end day, and you, if you're going to offer in multiple, then you have one teacher who is teaching this on, you know, the online third grade, you're the online third grade teacher. That's your job. And you're not having a teacher then who's also you're okay. This is your class. And, you know, 20 of the students are going to be in person and eight are going to be online. So you have to double, you have to plan for this. You have to have time. You have to figure all this out. People are like, I'm forget it. I'm out of here. I'm not doing it. I'm just not doing it. So Parkinson's law. The second thing is year round school, year round school. Again, I, I ran this past 20 students this fall and who are currently again, educators, principals, or, or, you know, teachers. And, and they said, you know what, the whole, we're ready for year round school. We've been ready for a while instead of having this big block of time off in summer, because kids used to work on farms, you know, family farms and, um, you know, where I'm at, there's all recreation in summer. So kids have to be off in summer to work at the water parks and, you know, the resorts and lodges and stuff like that. That's just not the way that it is anymore. And, and so if you could split things up, you naturally would have these breaks, right? You'd have these, these breaks. So I'm going to get into that, but let me get over to the, the chat. Um, so over here, Moose Gal, Americans think teachers make good pay because they get summers off. Yeah. And um, yeah, teachers aren't getting um, the summers off. I remember when I when I started teaching, I worked in a district that rearranged their schedule one year to not have uh, to basically have um, no Christmas vacation. No, th I mean it was like just straight through. It was just crazy. But the school got done like May thirteenth or something and didn't start up until September third because there was a law in my state you couldn't start until after Labor Day. So it was massive time off. But, you know, they ran into other issues with that, with professional development, but for one year. But, but yeah, I mean, there's so much professional development, um, you know, that comes into things. Plus summer school and kind of these, you know, there is some semblance already of some year-round schooling. And athletics does this in all of our schools. Like they've adapted their calendar. So athletics runs 12 months out of the year. So hey, it is man against the masses. Um, there he is again. It's telling the bacon. So yeah, I was out last night. It's cold. My uh, fingers were cold. So <laughs> I didn't realize how how uh, cold I was until I I got in and and I was feeling in my fingers. I finally like came back. It was just holding the camera out there. Um, but yeah, Sunday was on the track last night. It's like thirty degrees and um, outdoors. No way they'd allow that. Just what teachers get in trouble for as it is. Um, so like the cameras, right? So like. To, to think that there would be cameras, there'd be a big barrier to that. Um, now, to think that you could have curriculum, and there's there's a bill in Wisconsin that curriculum needs to, if it passes, would need to be posted online. The syllabus, what's instructed, that would all need to be accessible by parents. And then, I mean, you could do, um, if it's, you know, typically smart boards, which are these whiteboards where your instruction comes up. And just kind of like your computer monitor, like everything's recorded, but necessarily it wouldn't be students in the in the room, so it wouldn't break confidentiality. And you'd have to just figure out what that would look like, and the state would have to jump in for you know curriculums that you're con you're buying, or you're subscribing with vendors, because vendors aren't going to want that, right? No vendor is going to want um, you know this to be publicly available that somebody can log in and and see proprietary information, you know, that they create it and then you know try to to hack it, you know, try to try to make their own version of it. Um, so, um, Zippy mile wide inch deep is shallow, but can be seen from many directions, but still inch deep. Mental health is an inch wide and a universe deep, meaning very misunderstood, very complicated. Yeah, you're right on. So there's Zippy. There's a, there's a video and for everybody, um, it is called children of darkness. And I'm putting it in here. 
and the year is 1983 for if you type it in a Google search um, it'll it's a it's a documentary I think it was done by PBS but 1983 and it shows um, mental health approaches for youth and as you watch it I mean you'll think it was something from the 50s or 60s but it's 1983 and for example um, the psychiatrist were having a, a kid who was running away from this this remote or, or this um, this school, but you know, but basically, um, kind of this not this school alternative school. This kid who was running away from this alternative school, um, he had him dress up in a pink bunny suit because he thought if he'd run away he'd be embarrassed. And then at one point, you watch this video. Um, he had the kid stay in a trash can like. Um, not an Oscar, the grouch trash can, but, um, you know, one of the big, big trash bin, you know, the, the truck lifts up and stuff like that dumpster. And they had the kids stay in a dumpster and they had other kids guard the dumpster. If the kid got out, then all the kids would be in trouble. So, so this whole thing is like a lot of this, this whole mental health framework, it was 2015. It presented on PB about this on PBS in 2019, it was 2015. There was a bill called mental health in schools it would have provided a framework and funding and all of that for mental health across all 50 states, at least how it could look in schools, how assessment could look. It didn't pass. Uh, this is patchwork. Everybody, every district does this uniquely. Um, how counties fund this and partner with districts is from, you know, somewhat of logical and based on science to some counties saying, we don't have the funding for it or we don't have any providers up here. So you're on your own. Um, so there is no reliability or, and some of it too is like mental health, um, is I've seen it in schools where they'll identify a student for mental health services. And then the student gets eight sessions. Well, does eight sessions cure the situation? Does it, does it fix it? Or, you know, what's the deal? Shouldn't it be that there's some assessment done and then you indicate once you get to this baseline or if you're not responding to treatment, then it discontinues. And it's kind of like that thing with days off. It's like, when does it become effective? Well, here, let's go. Let's talk about this. So in, in um, uh, Dr. John Apple, World War II psychiatrist, he studied burnout in soldiers and he discovered that uh, frontline soldiers would be killed, wounded, captured, have mental collapse, or be found missing in action by 200 days. So basically by 200 days, you're done in uh, frontline combat. And so he was looking at ways to, you know, make, make soldiers um, able to endure the, that, you know, frontline combat longer. A few things that he did was he got with Dr. Seuss. So uh, what Ted Geis, right? And they were making videos of Frank Capra, you know, they're showing these, these uh, new recruits of how to fight, like why we fight and stuff like that. You can find them on YouTube and short, you know, these video clips from back in the forties, why we fight, thought his motivation. They didn't kid, you know, these young soldiers didn't know why they're coming over and it just overwhelmed them. Well, that wasn't the case. It wasn't motivation. Um, and they thought like, you know, this whole thing of we'll, we'll pay you more like to be up at the front. And they're like, you can't pay me enough to be up at the front. You know, that's not, that wasn't the thing either. So here's what they found out. So Apple and his colleagues are they're studying soldiers and they're looking over at the British. So the British were getting 400 days out of their soldiers. So the U.S. was getting 200 before they're killed, captured, missing action. British are getting 400 days. Again, this is all in the blog post. Um, so they're like, well, how is that working? So what the British would do is they you'd be on the front for 12 days and then you'd get four days off. And in that four days, I mean, you you had your departments. Um, that focused on, um, you know, basically it was recreation. Like there was a big, big component of, you know, recreation for soldiers that were away from, away from the front, not one day. So it was, this, it was 12 days and four days off, it's 12 days and four days off. And people, soldiers were able to get up to 400 days, right? Before they would, would be killed, wounded, captured, mental collapse. So it wasn't this one day off, it was four days off. And then there was a complete division um, for, soldier morale and um, basically uh, soldier kind of like well-being. I mean, if you can imagine what that would be back in the 40s, which, you know, would, would mean like, hey, we're, you know, we're going to have, um, you know, bowling alley that you're going to be at, and right? It was a cigarette and some whiskey or something like that. But I mean, but it was this, it was this, this acknowledgement, right, that it's just not a day away. It's a day away. It's multiple days away, and it's a program. It's completely getting away from that to address this, this mental fitness. And then also in the, these, not only in addition to lasting longer, but they could do more tours. And when they got back home after the war, they integrated more successfully than 
people who are just at the front. So again, this whole thing of like, this is a good study. Again, I've got it cited in there um, of if you just give a day off, right? And you don't have any plan for that, that doesn't do, that doesn't do anything. Um, so again, we, so what does this mean? Well, if we break up the school schedule, if we go to an all year school where, you know, you have, instead of the whole summer off, you have different times during the school year where you might have maybe, you know, five times during the school year, you have three weeks off or whatever it is, um, that would address some of this stuff, right? You're building in some of those, some of those breaks. So anyway, it's kind of, it's modeling after the John Apple World War II, the tours um, of service. And not to compare teaching with tours of service, but the psychology in that um, wasn't just also with soldiers. Uh, they were using it for people all the way through the different chains of supply in chains of, of working for um, media, you know, for the war effort and in factories and things like this of, of these rotational models. Now, it would be adapted, right? Because I mean, if you're in a, typically in a factory, like it's not being in a front line, but, um, but yeah, so, so this John Apple study, and I think year round schooling, year round schooling, and that's what the educators tell me, Dave, if we had year round schooling, we, th we think um, we would have higher retention. We think we'd have less burnout for teachers. We also think kids wouldn't come back after summer and be like, hey, like the first month, I'm just trying to relearn what I knew last year and I forgot it. So there's something else here. Embrace crowd in mindset, crowd in mindset. So what this means is like right now, nobody, unless it's bacon or it's man against the masses or zippy or moose cow, but nobody believes the current situation we're in is over, right? <laughs> Nobody believes this is transitory. Like no one thinks that, oh, in two months from now, this will all be done, meaning pandemic related restrictions and, and supply chain stuff. Like, no, this is an extended period of uncertain times. Like you'd be crazy to start a coffee shop during this time, you know, right? Or to be an entrepreneur and rent a place, you know, downtown to open up a business only to be declared non-essential by the government off of some decree, you know? So, so this is a time when people don't believe this is transitory. Just look at inflation, right? All those, those negative bad signs. So what people lose, they, they just pull close, right? And so I wrote about it in, in my book, there's crowd in behavior. People are surrounding them thing, themselves with things that make them feel comfortable, um, you know, nicer furniture, a pool, pets, um, staying home and watching, you know, movies and, you know, versus like travel and stuff like that. So it's just like more of this is, it's just getting tighter. So there's, so we have to embrace crowd in. What crowd in too means is as a school, remember all these initiatives, you, you guys were talking about them, all these initiatives that schools have. I, so I was on an administrative team and we did a retreat. Oh God, this was like seven, eight years ago. And I'll never forget it. We're at the retreat, you know, and the superintendent's there and, and, um, you know, the, the discussion is, so what do we do to like, you know, back then kind of counter, you know, teacher, you know, burnout and, and what do we do to move this district forward? What are, what are our vision and our goals and stuff, you know? And, you know, I always kind of break that down and say, well, you know, do we, uh, how about we figure out where kids reading levels at? And then once we know that, then we, do, we do things to hopefully move them forward from that. <laughs> but yeah, it has kind of crazy talk, right? So, and, 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 you know, people were talking about all these initiatives and I'd be like, I don't even, I don't know what half these things are. And I work here for God's sakes. I work here. I didn't, what is this that you're talking about here as a strategic alignment of, of, uh, you know, social, emotional learning to, um, well, I'm like, what? I'm like, how, how do you even measure this? And I, I, I don't know what it is. <laughs> Again, I work here. I'm one of the administrators, right? I'm pretty sure. So, so this thing just gets compounded. Like people come in and they add initiatives, nothing comes off. And I said, um, I said, I think we need three initiatives and that's it. And like everybody just, the room got silent. And and uh, yeah, so the person leading that was like, oh no, we can't do that. I'm like, well, why the hell not? And I knew another administrator that did that. He came in and, and said, you know, let's just, we'll narrow it down and let's get really good at these three things. And then if we do three new things the next year, then we're up to six and we do three new things instead of like zippy, you know, this, this endless like, mile wide, inch deep, and I know kind of universe deep. So that's another thing crowd in is saying, get stuff off the plate. So I don't know if you guys remember this, Michael Keaton, the movie, Mr. Mom, all right, back in the eighties. So um, 
his wife went to work. So he was working um, at a car man manufacturer and it was bad economic times to get laid off. He's like an engineer or something. And there are no jobs to be found. But his wife went back to work um, in the advertising industry. And she worked for this company, Schooner Tuna, Schooner Tuna. And they were doing all these gimmicks to try to get people to buy tuna, you know, like trip to Hawaii and stuff like that. And, and people were like, you know, they didn't fall for that. And she's like, hey, like, why don't, why don't you be sincere and just take, lower the price of tuna? And, and the, the guy, you know, the president of the company, everybody kind of laughed and they're like, we can't do that. It's, you know, profit and all stuff. And, and the president of the company is like, yeah, let's give it a try. Like, we'll show empathy to people. When, so this whole thing in the, the show is like, Scooter Tuna, the tuna with a heart. And they lowered their price, 50 cents a can. And they said, during the current crisis, we're going to empathize with you, the consumer, right? And, um, and the sales in the movie, like, went through the roof, right? Like, this was a brilliant decision to do this. It's the same thing with schools, the scooter tuna approach, scooter tuna for schools, Get, sit down as an administrative, as a school board and stuff, and just say, here's the deal. Like this, 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 and this is gone right now. We're not going to work on this stuff, which probably shouldn't have been on the plate or was just lingering from past administration. The barnacles on the boat. We're not going to deal with it right now. Like here are your three priorities. And again, I know administrators who are doing that right now. They're clearing the decks. And yeah, can you do this perpetually? Probably not. Um, maybe you could, but right now in crowd in, when you have this crisis for trying to find teachers, teachers burning out, you've got to look at that plate and say, what go, what comes off of this? What is the stuff that we've got on here that maybe it's some goony state mandate that no one's going to check on anyway, or if we do get our hands slapped on it, it's, you know, what, what are we going to clear off of here? So embrace crowd in and get that, get stuff off the plate that shouldn't be there. Get really good at like three things. And then, I mean, these people will be like, yeah, I buy into this. I want to be here. You're schooner tuna, the tuna with a heart. So um, I've got two more and I still have 24 minutes to go. Let me go over here to the, to the chat. Um, Bacon wrote to man against the masses. I'm stuck at home, but would be tuned in either way. So thank you, Bacon. Appreciate that, buddy. Um, the best Wi-Fi out on the uh, eastern or western coast, not eastern coast, uh, is uh, Dismore's IGA. Go to Dismore's to their deli. Five bars. Five out of five bars for uh, Wi-Fi. Fast. Now you could upload a, a video like, um, you know, The Dark Knight in about four seconds at a Dismore's IGA. So Moose Gal wrote... Uh, B3 outdoors to B3 outdoors. Yes and no. On one hand, it might make a bad teacher stop. Secondly, we don't want citizens or don't we want citizens to have uh, privacy? So I appreciate that. Thanks for the comments. Um, Zippy wrote, well, teacher pay is half the reason why no one wants to be a teacher. Though if teachers had to do half the workload by having more teachers, it could work. So yeah, um, it's, a, it's a good point. And I mean, the other part with teacher compensation is teachers have really typically a robust p a pension fund. If you've put 30 years into education, you know, you have a, as long as you live, right, you have a lifetime pension and you, otherwise it's like 15 years. Um, but there, you know, are pretty robust pensions that go with that and, you know, health benefits and things like that. So, so to look at the total package on some of these can be pretty attractive, but again, people, People are very short term right now, right? You know, like they look at a job as something they're going to do for this year or next year. And then they're just applying at other places um, because they know they can play kind of that's that bonus, um, that sign on bonus. Um, it, and that's a, it's happening in education. Never thought I'd see that in education, but the sign on bonus, like I had a case study just <laughs> built on this. It was a teacher who got a $50,000 sign on bonus in a district to teach tech ed. And the question was, um, you know, in the case study, like, what do you, what do you do? This person comes to you and says, Hey, I got this contract offer. Do, um, you know, do you, do you try to counter? Do you go to your board? What do you do then if you try to match it? And because if this person leaves and you replace them, it's going to be hard to or impossible because there's so few of these people out there. And what if people, kids unenroll, what stress do you add to your, I mean, so we're, so these, so you have to go, like, what do you do? Are you, are you going to, would you counter this? Would you not counter this? I mean, stuff like we never thought you'd have to do that. What does it mean for, again, making other people whole in your department? You have to raise their salaries up if you give somebody else, you know, the salary. So, um, Moose Gal wrote, teachers actually deserve more pay. I have a friend that worked in Baltimore school district. He says he hardly made any money at a second job. 
So um, I'm not against I, I'm I'm not against changing pay schedules and and looking at pay schedules and and things like that. Um, I think um, that like if we were to come in and and double teacher pay, I don't think we'd have more teachers necessarily, and I don't think we would have. Again, I think retention would maybe increase, right? Or especially if you if you restructured things to say, if you're here so many of you, kind of like this 401k matching thing, but you know, if you're here so many years, then you'll get like this bonus and this bonus, which maybe would work in education, like that works in other industries. Um, but education really isn't set up that way, which is, that's a good point, Muscal. Like education isn't designed on kind of this bonus and badging. We talked about this badging before, you know, that blue badge that soldiers will get if they're on the front line. You know, maybe if you've done a couple of years in a district, you know, you get some badging, it, not necessarily like a patch or something, but you're, you, you move up to a tier where you're recognized as this, you know, whatever tier, um, you know, educator, and then all these uh, different competencies that can boost your, your recognition, such as, you know, taking um, some training in, you know, web-based in instruction or, you know, Whatever, whatever it would be that the district kind of just expects you to do now, maybe that gets tied into a badging and compensation. I, I've said a long time in the classes I teach, I'm like, for school safety, for example, like FEMA offers these outstanding free online courses. You just type in like online safety courses plus FEMA, and they're they're free and and they're terrific. And like you know, it's it can be um, in an early child school safety in an early childhood setting, or you know safety for students with disabilities or whatever. I mean, and, and you'll find these things that I'm like, I would give credit for that, right? Like if I'm you, superintendent, I would ask the board and say, hey, HR, as you said, Muscal, um, have this set up where if you do some of these classes, then it, it moves you into a tier. I think people need this, this badging. It's like a video game system in a way, which actually scientifically, I knew um, one, of the, one of the people that... Um, was a creator of like Minecraft and stuff like that. And they're like, yeah, totally, totally. Right. It's built on all of the video game system. When you, when you pick up a video game, the game teaches you and rewards you and keeps you motivated, right? Like a, a, a few people will just put the controller down and say, this sucks. Like, I don't want to play this anymore. Like that's, that's not the way it is. That's why the gaming is kind of this addictive. And there's a way to hack that. And I wrote about that in the philosophy of information too. Um, and, and we already do it right on social media. Like someone, you know, you have some accomplishment that says, hey, hey, Muscal, do you want to post this over to your social media accounts that you, you know, did this or whatever? It's like, oh, sure. Um, so, yeah, I think some of the fitness devices have that that built in. So um, man against the masses, stuck at home. Oh, the bacon. Uh, one, if teachers need a mental day break, mental health day break, doesn't that in and of itself imply they're not suitable for the job during that time? So um, it's a tricky one, one, right? Because... The thing is like, okay, if you're saying, right, teachers need the break, wouldn't this extend to um, nursing home workers and people um, over the over the road truck drivers and mechanics um, and, you know, people, I mean, you, you could continue to go down this line and that's also where I, I don't, let's say that we just came out and said, everybody out there, is going to whatever profession they're in, they're going to have 10 days next year or they're going to be at home holidays. What would that do? Well, is it going to improve supply chain or the demand for services or things like this? And, and you know, is it's, it wouldn't have a positive impact on any of those things. So now, yeah, I mean, I guess if you had some program put into that and there was a specific thing that people were doing or this, this, you know, fitness or other things, but that's not it. Right. So, um, and I don't know if it's the teachers asking for this so much as it's kind of school boards and teachers organizations, and then it just gets trendy, right? Somebody does a conference on it or a school board association and they're like, oh, look what we did. And, you know, it's, again, it has this whole empathy tone to it in, instead of really asking, well, you've just, you, I mean, like the teachers I talk to, they're like, this isn't helping. <laughs> We're not asking for this. Like, you know, um, give us um, a couple extra paid days in summer, right, to work on curriculum and things like this or whatever. And or, you know, they're just like, this isn't helping. Um, so 
Zippy wrote, there's a reason for that aside from supply and demand. One, yes, most never were. So if you start the podcast right at this point, you're like, whoa, um, bacon to uh, man against the masses. Engine went out on my way home. No bacon. That's why you got to change your oil, buddy. Um, where's the captain when you need him? Dun, dun, dun. Um, summer's off is huge, even if just in July. So all pro Leminton. Yeah. And I, I, I do think there's a, a, a value in that. I mean, when I worked in education, when I moved into administration, I didn't have summers off anymore. Um, but, in and, but I would try to structure, you know, my time off, like when the weather's good, like in summer. So, I mean, that was good. And, and as you said, all pro Leminton. So like you could, we could do an all year schedule for schools and still do July off. You could totally do that. But now, you know, schools, typically it's June, July, August off. And some of the schools are even trimming that more. They're like, well, let's go till the middle of May and let's start the middle of September. And it's like, well, at some point, like, right, your function is to have instructional time with kids not and, and not to decrease that because then the kids are getting less. Um, man against mess. Well, that blows goat's bacon about the motor out. Um, Zippy wrote, true, but teachers are kind of that thing that stabilizes the economy as people move from study to work. A bad educational system slows the economy. Um, right. <laughs> right. Um, without a without a doubt. Um, and uh, B3 Outdoors, I'm all for it. So Zippy, teaching the test is half the way the educational system sucks. The cost to create all-in-one static testing is too high in many ways. So you're right. You know, these these states bid out for these, you know, what's going to be our test for Wisconsin and stuff like that. And it's like, it is just one test, you know, and not every, and that's just, it's a, it's a flawed system to think that way. Right. But it is for, it's built for the masses. And then they try to compare one state to another, and then they aggregate it to like the U S versus Portugal and stuff like that. And, and so, yeah, teachers definitely are, they know what is going to be assessed, you know, largely. So they're teaching, you know, um, to that it's, it's very, um, it's, it's very constricting. Right. Um, so, and again, now you have less time to do that. So, Hey, it's Armitage coming over here from our good friend uh, over at the DLD, uh, dark. So, um, and Armitage, your, your channel. So I appreciate you. Hey, all thank you. Thank you, buddy. Um, Schools have the capacity to retain that data. I mean, there's a lot of storage space. So yeah. By the way, like I've been dumping most of my Google Drive because I um I I don't know if you've been hit up with this, but like Google Drive kept prompting me, like, hey, like upload to the new. We're getting rid of backup and whatever, and and upload to the new streaming thing. <laughs> so I did, like after my backup just started to or stopped working. And then I had all these issues for like three days. Like nothing was syncing. So I got all of my friend. He was like, you know, works in tech. And I'm like, what the hell's going on here? It's like, oh, God, you're not the only one. So it kind of stepped me through it. But even now, like, it's not very reliable. So, but anyway, so I, I've been pulling a lot of my stuff off of Google Docs and just putting it on my my local drive. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, let's, um, all right, Dirk, McG Dirt McGirt. Sup, Sensei, hey, buddy. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you for coming over here. Thanks for taking a break from uh good friend Dark over at DLD. Appreciate that, buddy. Yeah, buddy. Um, so Zippy, it's great, Doc. You need old views. I'm happy uh, to just get one video finished. So I appreciate I've, I, my views. Yeah, I've been, I've been coming. Thank you for the 22 thumbs up in this show, by the way. I had that kind of breakout show. Well, that's a compliment of DLD and, and the network he connected me, me in with on Friday. Um, that was really an awesome day. Like I had screenshots. I had like 1,200 people watching at one time and like 2.4 thousand um, thumbs up. So I have the screenshots to prove it. Um, yeah, that was that was just an amazing, amazing day. Um, so let me go back. So there, there's two more things. So we already talked about three things that would help address uh, staff burnout, or teacher burnout. One, Parkinson's law. You're you're working this time frame, and no, you're not going to instruct online, hybrid, and uh, you know, face to face, you're not going to plan for all those things. Cause you're going to be working 24 hours a day. It's going to burn you out. You be out here. You're around school. It's, I think it's time. Teachers want it by the way, um, embrace crowd in. So like get rid of initiatives that are all just ancillary. that just barnacles on the boat that you're really not paying attention to anyway, <laughs> get rid of them. 
your three, maybe get down to like three things that you're going to do this year. Just hone it in. And I do, I know administrators who are doing that and staff are like, thank you. Thank you. We, it's this mentality in schools, like more is better. Like you, you get the community together. What do you want to see for the 30 year vision for our school and all of this? And then, you know, you've got this affinity list and it's like, you know, 82 things. And it's like, you know, here's our 82 objectives. I'm like, that's crazy. And, you know, again, I called it out at an administrative team meeting and I, I almost had a walk home from that thing. I mean, I'm like, am I, there's gotta be other people in here thinking the same thing I am, right? Like, seriously, I'm not off on this, right? You're just not saying it. Like you just don't, you don't want to get the, uh, the wrath here of, of administration, right? Which I've part of that cabinet. Like, but what I'm saying is right. Right. I mean, and no one's, no one's willing to, to stand up and be like, yeah. So, and it was that point too. I kind of realized like, yeah, this setup isn't really working, working for me. So yeah, tuna, uh, schooner tuna, Mr. Mom, got to have that approach. Schooner tuna. Um, okay. Cracked boards, cracked boards. Um, I orig originally have this in my book as crack boards, um, which kind of makes you think it has to do with drugs. <laughs> and then I talked to Clay Martin and he's like, no, it's cracked boards. So I'm like, oh, I've got to go back with my publisher on the proof and I've got to change it from crack to cracked. But so Clay Martin is, um, is a recon, a former recon Marine and a sniper. And he, and he, I interviewed him and have a chapter about him in the book. And he said, you know, cause I asked him, I said, how did, how did you deal with stress? Like uncertain, you know, you could be killed right um, out on, out on combat. And um, how'd you deal with that? And he's like, you know, once, once you get to maybe, I don't know, 50, 60 days, like, yeah, people would start to crack. They would do something, um, you know, normally they wouldn't do some, some overt mistake. Like they forgot to put bolts in their gun or something like that. Um, but he said, um, we had cracked boards. So it was like a, maybe like a piece of cardboard. And if someone was just, they lost it, they would put their name up on it, you know, like, Hey, Clay Martin or whatever. And then they, you know, it was ritual or his dance or whatever. And it was like, you named it, you owned it. I burned out. I cracked. Well, you didn't burn out. It's a before burnout thing. It's recognizing that you're, it trips the fuse. That's a crack board, but we don't do that. Right. We don't do that. We don't acknowledge that people are, um, approaching this finite voltage or burnout. We just expect people to hit it, like suck it up and hit it like in anything. Right. Like, and it's okay to, it's, it's very good to name these things, to name your fears, like to acknowledge this and give it a name and say, hey, I'm up on the crack board. Now it's not an excuse. So you're not done then you just, you're like the steam, the pressure kind of goes off and you've named it and whatever. And, you know, then maybe you're taking a, maybe you're taking a break, you're getting yourself back in, but, but then you're, you're coming back. And it is this extreme mental release, this cracked board approach. Again, it's that fuse before you hit burnout. Breaks prevent breakdowns, but not a break of a day when you're just like, oh, here's a day and, you know, away and there's no structure to it. I mean, breaks prevent breakdowns. These cracked boards. So it's amazing. You read about it in the book, cracked boards. Here's the last one. The last one is quit zooming. Quit zooming. So I interviewed Linda Stone. She was an executive with Microsoft in um, the 2000s, I think she was vice president in the year 2000 of Microsoft. And she's in the first uh, part of my book and Linda had studied attention. So the, the thing was, um, she it was the study of how long will people interface with a computer? Like when they do an internet search, like what will freak them out? If they get 204 results, will they be like, I'm out of here. I'm not doing, this is too much. So the, and she learned more and more about attention. And what Linda said, and wrote about, she said, you know, attention is, um, attention is very, um, attention is, is, is serial, meaning like I can pay attention to this right now, but if, if someone is over here talking to me, like I'm not able to, I'd have to like attend to them. I can't do the two things at once, or I'm trying to like type and add to the notes over here. So our attention is very serial. And she said, you know, there's this misnomer, right? That you can, you can split your attention and keep diluting it out. And it just doesn't work that way. And she talked specifically about zooming and she was consulting with people at the time last year when I interviewed her and she was, and people would say like, I, I got, you know, this is, this is, you know, we got another two hour zoom meeting today. And she's like, do you really need to do that? Because you have to audio, right, audio and video. Like I got to watch what I'm wearing. Doc's got to do his purple shirt and all of this stuff. And she's like, if you do just audio, right. You're able to concentrate more, your attention is focusing more. It's not attention on the background and all this other stuff. Maybe, you know, there's some accompanying documents that get sent to you, but you don't have this constant 
consuming of your mind of visual and audio, which can burn, will burn you out, wear you out over time, just overloads you. So she's like, quit zooming. Like just so if you absolutely have to do it, or if it's like a, a school thing where you need to do it with, you know, you're teaching a class, you need to have students at a certain time, limit it. And then after that, um, you know, don't, don't zoom every meeting with everybody. And we just got into this crazy zoom culture, which we're still at today. Like I had a meeting, somebody set up with me and they're like, Hey, like, can you go on Skype? I'm like Skype? Holy smokes. I think I still have a Skype account. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was it was absolutely crazy because I'm like, well, can we do this by phone call? That's another thing. When I would interview people for my book, I didn't interview them necessarily with um, with video. I mean, a couple of people I did, I had them on the show like Larry Lawton and we got stuff from video, but I would always do follow-ups and we would just do by phone. And then, because um, I, I didn't want them also, I didn't want to give away like also feedback. Like if I was interested or not interested. I didn't want to convey cues and just, I could focus then on my notes and what I wanted to convey. So quit zooming. So how, how do we, how do we, um, five things that doc says we do right now that will help offset teacher burnout. So five things. So, um, the first thing is obey Parkinson's law, right? You're, you're teaching, you know, your, your contracted time, and you're also, it is, you're not teaching online, hybrid, and in-person, all those three planning things. It's going to burn you out. That's too much. Like, that should be split across multiple people. <laughs> like, here's your online person who's, who's doing your online, because that's a different form of instruction. I've done that. Like, again, I teach online in spring semesters at the university level, in-person fall, completely different of how I have to assemble, grade, instruct, all of that. If I were to do those two things concurrently, I think I'd go crazy. I don't think I could do it. Um, so suddenly, yeah, that's that's become this model. It's trendy because schools want to provide all these options so they don't lose kids. But the reality is they're losing teachers. Teachers are like, I'm out of here. Second is year-round school. Yeah, I mean, like um, uh, Leamington, you you know, you know that um, you know July is important to have off. You can still have July off, and you can spread time off, you know, throughout the year to do these kind of resets. We talked about, um, you know, Dr. John Apple saying, hey, like. The soldiers that were at the front, now again, you know, this isn't a great comparison, but, you know, in, in the British soldiers, when they had more frequent time off, so time at the front and then time off and time on, it, it, they perform better. And I think that's, and the teachers tell me they're ready for this. Like, we just believe this model is, is it's time, which that's a sacred cow, right? If you're going to mess with the school schedule, holy smokes. But, you know, and the other part is another one, uh, part three, embrace crowd in mindset. This is a time where no one believes this is going to end anytime soon. So get into this crowd in mindset and, and, you know, and focus on the three main things that you're going to have for initiatives versus the 30 main things, right? Your schooner tuna, tuna with a heart. You're going to get some things off of the plate. Um, so yeah, uh, initiative overload, stand up and be bold as an administrator and a board and say, yeah, we're going to idle some of these things. And I know it sends this message maybe like, oh, this isn't important. No, it sends the message that our staff is important. We are in this time right now of crowd in. People are, are finite voltage. They've, they don't believe this is transitory. We don't need them. Uh, you know, We'll address this when we get to a more stable footing. And the thought is, right, we would, re we would regress to a point of more stable footing where maybe we could introduce. Personally, to be honest, I don't think you should ever have more than three initiatives in a school year. Like no matter what, even if it's the best year ever, right? Like every day is 80 degrees and sunny and everybody attends and nobody ever gets sick and everything runs on time. I still don't think you should have more than three initiatives. Um, so, and I'll stand back or stand by that. Um, cracked boards. We talked about Clay Martin, a recon um, Marine saying, hey, like you get to a point when you just, you, you, the fuse blows, right? And the fuse is meant to blow before the circuit just, just burns out. And it's okay. Like just reckon, acknowledge it and do like a little ceremony and it's a crack board. And it's like, all right, we're, we're going to, uh, to move on from here. Breaks prevent breakdowns. So acknowledging it, but you know, it's always, oh, this will be a sign of weakness if we, and, and I think this is like this weird pseudo crack board going on now of saying, oh, a day off is a crack board. Well, no, that's not it. That doesn't work that way. Um, but it, it, there's a lot to be learned from acknowledging when people hit this high amount of stress and having them say like, boom, like I've hit it, but then also like back out and then regroup and come back in 
um, and, and keep going. Um, so yeah. And the last, the last one, point number five is quit zooming or, you know, all your, you don't have to do as much through concurrent, um, through zoom, um, audio and video doesn't need to happen. So a lot of the stuff can be done through audio. And I think also, um, you know, it also saves time versus like typing in long emails and stuff like that. Like do audio. Like I would have times when I would communicate with people that I hadn't communicated for and for a while. And I'm like, okay, instead of, I had a boss that would do this and we're down here to a minute left. I'm just going to stop it right here. So we don't do the, the beep thing. So we're pretty much close to done. I had a boss and I found this, um, I found a message today. One of one of the best bosses I ever worked for, like left me his voicemail. He's like, Oh, like you did such a great job. on like, you know, this, this project and all, you know, these points of it. And I'm like, yeah, that's really a cool thing to do. Like, yeah. Yeah. Again, I just happened to find that I was cleaning out my Google drive, but, um, but yeah, it is, it is so, um, you know, I, I, I would, I would, you know, someone would send me a long email or something or something. Like, well, I, I could type a response back, which would take forever for me. Um, or I can just record, you know, just do a little audio file and then attach it like, you know, a, a two minute audio file, you know, you're not doing a big thing and saying like, here it is. And sometimes like, it was just more personal for people too. Um, now I know under, you know, creating records and stuff like there are certain things I would only email back, but, um, but yeah, I mean, that's the thing is instead of spending all of this time scheduling a zoom and all of this, it's, it's sometimes just doing a phone call, right. Is, is good. And, um, and, and for people to think that, yeah, they have to prepare to be, you know, on, on screen and, and, you know, their backgrounds and all of that stuff. So, um, it, it does, there's this thing called Zoomified, which I wrote about in my book. And, and I think, uh, uh, somebody came up with a, up with that term. It wasn't, it wasn't me. It wasn't Linda, but yeah, those things would, would instantly help things that won't help. Um, like, uh, just pay increases, just saying, we're going to give you more pay. Like if you're not changing the environment without changing the pay, like that's not going, people don't want that because they can go other places. Ultimately, people want to be happy, right? Um, and people, I mean, you can bring people in and say, listen, after 30 years, you're going to have a pretty good retirement here if, with the state system. Be like, 30 years? I mean, that's so weird to think about how systems have just changed so much in the last, you know, 30 months, right? So, um, you know, that doesn't work. But this, this thing, too, of um, setting it up so there's a lot of badges. Think about it as kind of a video game. And that's not as a negative. Um, workplaces do this now, Um but where you have frequent opportunities to obtain badges and to move up levels, and then you have compensation that maybe and recognition that matches that. Um, that's big. People want that. Um, so you're, you know, you can kind of go to this badging system. So, um, so again, you know, kind of just what started this off is I started, or I saw um, districts in my area announcing that they were taking mental health days. And my students were talking about it, of saying, hey, like in our district this week, you know, we, we had a, a Thursday and Friday was canceled because it's mental health days. And I'd be like, so what does it mean? I, so and I'd be like, just meant, you know, we're not in school that day. We're, so what'd you do? Like, what was mental health activity? What was, what'd you find the baseline for people or the, the mental health? Well, you know, again, it was really nothing except like it's just a break and just by being away from it it's going to get better and if we think about these things in other contexts they don't make any sense again you know i'm i'm um you know i work at a bank right so we're going to shut the bank down for three days as so we get a, a break and then we come back what's going to happen when you come back well like everyone's going to be there because they they want their banking right they want you know they've, they've had to wait three days for their their meetings and you know to do any in person or you know, whatever it is. So, so you're going to be crazy busy for the days to make up for the time you're off. It's the same thing in the schools. Like you have so much instruction has to be delivered. And by just taking these days by, by saying instead of 180 days, we'll have 170 days and, and the same amount of instruction. That's insane. So let's go over here to the, to the chat. Um, so the chat is our friend Bacon, who says almost 20 likes y'all winning. Yes, we're up to 24. So thank you. And if there's any new subscribers to the channel, I appreciate you guys. So I'm almost, I don't know where I'm at, but I think I'm almost at 600. So, but it's been like up a hundred in the last 28 days, which is really cool. Um, Dirt McDirt wrote, um, Dirt McGirt, like a tremendous amount of family been here the past six days. Oh, okay. Gotcha, buddy. Take a dump after said coffee, uh, black coffee. There is a conservative effort. This is Moose Gals Corner to degrade public education in the U.S. Why? 
So parents will put kids in private schools. Just what I've observed, look at the nonsense over CRT. So, um, yeah, I mean, talk about this in my courses. Um, and I think public public education has has become, um, it's also this, this, Moose Gallery, there's also this, this free agent aspect to districts competing against districts with open enrollment. Um, so it's not, it's not only over things like um, CRT, but it's, it's districts in my area competing over who has the best athletic facilities, flat out. And they say it in board meetings. They're not hiding it. It's saying, we put in a new, you know, this district was like, we put in a new football stadium and with artificial turf and that because there's four other districts around us that have it. And kids, you know, parents who have their kids play in sports, they want them to have this type of facility to play in and, and the media coverage just will draw. And I mean, these things of, so, um, it is, it is really this, this weird competition, you know, thing to between schools, like, so school budgets, like one of the schools, um, near me spends a pretty hefty chunk on advertising. So, Hey, you know, billboards and TV commercials for an open and roll to our district. And then you're kind of thinking, huh, like those are public dollars going to that district and they're spending those dollars on advertising to bring in students. But like those dollars should be used to educate students and pay staff and facilities. And so it's like this weird thing of like, you know, paying, you know, it, it's, it, it has, it's a weird feel it just as a, a, it's crazy. Um, so man against the mass, it seems as if teachers can't just turn it off. I think the thing is, with that too, man against the masses is, is teachers are expected to, by administration, expected to go in and update the grade books like within 24 hours. Now, also like if there's a report of bullying, harassment, uh, harm to self, harm to others, usually in school networks that goes through uh, a, a system which includes administrators, but it can also um, include educators in that. So. There are there are a lot of ways where um, you're, if you if you turn it off, it's almost viewed as a negligence, right? Like if you're a teacher and you don't have a grade in for a project within 24 hours, you're probably going to hear it from your administration because they've been hearing it from teachers. And and maybe this is a whole cultural thing that needs to to change, but um, everybody feels like they have instant access to people too. Uh, but that's a, that's a good one. So Armitage, uh, since they're doing remote teaching already, do you think more people will just go ahead and homeschool in the coming years? I do. I do. I think homeschooling will increase. Um, and I think the resources for homeschooling will will increase, um, such as as curriculums that parents can you know subscribe to or virtual field trips. I mean, I've and I kind of I'm not a big fan of virtual field trips, right? But I've you know when my kids were here when school is shut down, like we did virtual field trips to there. Okay. Get this. There was a, there's a mine, a lead mine in my state that I didn't know about. And I was kind of doing these things of like virtual and you, it, it was already set up where you can, you can go in and someone has done this 3d thing, kind of like how they sell houses. Now like you can do the 3d walk around. And, um, so like I, I had my, my daughter, you know, log into this and, and then she could go down the steps and, and like go down this tunnel. And I mean, it was the actual thing. Like we could, act, we could go there, you know, in summer and, and actually tour this thing. And she'd already be familiar. We'd be familiar with it. So I, I think those, those things are there. Um, and the communities, the forums and, and things like that. Um, so I, I do, I, I, I think that will be there. Now the, the part of homeschooling will be as more parents are also not obligated to drive and go to a physical work location, you know, they can go to their, their home office or just their laptop set up at the kitchen table or something. It's going to, to make it just logistically easier to do homeschooling. Um, it's not to say every parent can be like an, an educator necessarily. Um, but yeah, I do think I do. And the other thing with schooling is this whole, the whole structural thing, remember the year round calendar, like that's part of it. The whole thing of like, you have to go through grades. You have to go through 12 grades. You have to go through 24 semesters. You have to go. Um, I'm like, that doesn't make sense. Like for my oldest daughter, like right now, that is a really bad fit for her as a high school student. Um, it, it, it's very difficult in that. I mean, she doesn't need to go through all of that. 
Um, so to try to progress at a rapid rate through a system that is not module and competency based or skill set based, um, you know, you demonstrate competencies and you kind of move at your own competencies. So, you know, maybe you're going to move faster um, in, in some of these things. But no, it's like everybody has to, to go together, hold hands from first grade to second, second to third, third to fourth. That model just doesn't make sense anymore, right? Um, Dirt wrote, uh, the teachers were indoctrinated in college, a uh, vicious cycle. So what, so thanks for writing this, Dirt. What my administrators tell me is, they said, Dave, we miss the teachers from 20 years ago, like when we were new administrators, because when they came out, like they were eager to do some novel approach to teach math or, you know, literacy boards and every day, you know, to have a, um, a news um, report that the class would put together on, you know, white paper and they would write it up and then they would put it out in the hallway for the first couple hours of the day so other students could see it. So they could do like, you know, this gathering of information and logically like communicating, like that's gone. Like that's not taught anymore. You know, now, you know, so, so much is put onto what I would say, social emotional learning and you know it's kind of the trend thing and then i come back to that and say and they'll say like but you know so the teachers come out and it's like you know what what learning style you know kids are you and stuff like this and, but can, do you know where their reading level's at can you teach reading can you assess reading and it's kind of like no so they they're having to learn that on the job um andrew public school is dumbed down to the dumbest kid which leaves behind the smart and average kids um so that is um um there's a professor at University of Oshkosh who talks about kind of how No Child Left Behind and the other initiatives really worked um, to to make it so it was it was difficult for kids who are more advanced in academics to to progress because the system was calibrated more toward lower achievers. Um, so um, Moose Gal Corner aren't charter schools basically private. So um, yeah, S some are, some aren't. Um, kids need socialization. The interaction is key to becoming a functional member of society. So, and that's where, and I think usually homeschool parents that I, I know have a, a definite, um, socialization, right. In the community, in vivo experiences with kids, which is different than, you know, of, of these situations where kids are just logging on. And they're just sitting in front of the computer for so much of a day. And I remember talking to Morgan Rogue about this, who I wrote about in my book and Rogue Preparedness. She has, you know, her podcast and all that. And and so she's like, you know, in addition to to logging on and, and just doing like online instruction, like have kids then go out and draw a map of every around their house. Like so they have to like identify east, west, north. Um, you know, that they, they're proportionate. How far is this away? How many steps is this away? Like how many, um, yards or how many footballs is this from one to another? So, so you have all these activities and, and see, and then like, if you, okay, like put the map away and try to redraw it. So it's a situational awareness. So all of those things, but, but yeah, um, but it's a good point of getting kids out and interacting with, with people and just with society in, in general, right? <laughs> I mean, how to place an order, um, how to, as I said, you know, the civic stuff that was big when I was in school still in the, in the eighties, you know, there was, um, here's, here's the expectations for voting, right? Here's a responsibility if you're on a jury and stuff like this, and just like civic responsibilities has kind of gone out the window. Uh, Bacon wrote to dirt. Oh, wow. Family reunion. So let me work it uh, down here. Zippy to, uh, Andrew. That's what teaching to the test is, in my opinion. It beats low um, general skill knowledge into everyone all the same. So, yeah, I'm not a uh, I'm not a fan of this whole uh, you know assessment model that we've we've just fallen into. Which um, Dirt McGirt, um, Andrew, exactly. How many smarter kids get bored and just coast through on autopilot? Yeah, true. Yeah, they and they they know it's kind of like compliance theater. I wrote about in the velocity of information. Like, it's the people who knew in, um, you know, knew in August and September of 2020, if I just bring a mask with me to the store and put it on right before I get in and then take it off, put it in my pocket and then shove it in my, my cup holder in my car, but it's the same mask, you know, it's a compliance thing. And, and, and kids know how to game the system, especially smart kids know what to do um, 
to to keep them versus like really being challenged and and, and challenging themselves and being like eager and um they they just they they can read pretty well like what it takes to get through um Moose Gal, I don't think all homeschool is good for the country. There have been homeschooling situations where it's religious based. I've seen stories where improper science is learned. So, yeah, I I don't argue uh, with that. I think a balance, right? Um, Andrew S. Ask me how I know. Um, dirt McGirt to uh, Bacon. Yeah, deer season opened up. It's going to open up soon here, too. So, <laughs> another reason why, yeah, I'm not going to be walking. Um, at night um, on the fringes of town because I, I don't want to be lit up. Uh, Zippy, living with learning disabilities, going to elementary school in the 80s was hell. So I'm sorry to hear that, buddy. And yeah, in the 80s, that was um, that was also the start of the implementation of um, education for handicapped students, what's currently the Individuals with Disability Education Act. And like, it was when I, I remember the school I went to is four stories tall. 100 year old school in the 80s and they built they, and they brought in a yellow mobile home bright yellow mobile home and set it next to the school in the back right and so you had to go through the back door and it, it had a ramp and a couple of my friends would disappear to this this building every once in a while and they come back they always have these cool stickers but that was like for you know i guess learning disabilities is early stuff but it was not inclusive and oh my goodness like it um yeah again it was figuring things out and I, and today like things have got it's and today when I talk to students, you know, they're like, you know, now we have so many um, students who are coming in and and saying, you know, a, a medical diagnosis of um, anxiety or depression, mental illness and so forth. So like all of these things, um, it, it's, it's so much. Um, let's look. Um, Armitage, Dirt McGirt, you all dirt season specific to you or deer season talking. Um, Zippy, in my opinion, why dynamic testing, teaching to personal skill in general or general um, skill focus a bit more on personal skill, slot kids to segment at home room classes. So yeah, dynamic testing, right? I mean, this would make sense to, to take kids based upon their skill levels and kind of move them forward in basically modules. Um, like that's a, that's a good model. It's, it's just, it's different, right? And education is going to be, it's going to be hard to, to sell people on that other than to do some pilots. But if things get more and more, dire with more teachers leaving and things like that, you're going to have some districts who are going to say, you know, we're, we're ditching the whole grade system. Like we are going to do it now in modules. And then you'd have to somehow shoehorn that in with like the sports, the athletic agencies, because they say, oh, kids only have like so many semesters of eligibility. You'd have to make it kind of just like a time frame, but it could work. Charter schools, this is Muscals, are institutions that are publicly funded but privately managed. They receive public money based on enrollment figures like public school students do not have to pay tuition. Yep. Yep. Thanks, Muscal. Um, so Zippy wrote, the homerooms focus on XYZ teaching, good with hands, data management, systems organizations, data management, and research. So thank you, Zippy. Bacon, dude, I had it bad enough. Thought summer's off. I probably would have been put on SSRIs for real if I had to go year round. So um, yeah. And I would say and no one really knows what that looks like because a few people, a few districts do year round. But I think if you had it done and I, we don't know yet. So is it a model worth piloting and seeing if it, if it does, um, decrease burnout, if it, if it does, um, increase retention of learning and, and things like this. And so, but yeah, <clears throat> And Zippy wrote, I have uh, four to six home home classes. I'll start with three to four, fourth grade kids slot it to refine their skills. So it's all stuff out there, buddy. Um, here, bacon. Thankfully, um, there were no pills in the South in the 80s. I'll be eating Ritalin 24 7. So, uh, so, and we didn't even get in, into that and burnout and things like this, too. One of the things, again, my students said in fall to me, and these are, again, these are, either teachers or administrators. Hey, thank you for the thumbs up and for following the channel. 24 thumbs up. This is awesome for the show. I appreciate it so much. Um, but yeah, kids coming out and, and, and teachers saying these kids are coming back and they're medicated. Like they've already been medicated before that, but schools buy gun cabinets just to store their medications. Like that's a fact. And you know, it is so this level of medication and it's not just Ritalin now, you know, it's lithium and stuff like that, that these, these kids are coming in with. This is a heavy duty, crazy stuff. 
Um, so yeah, pretty, pretty intense. Um, and so let's kind of wrap through comments. Uh, hey, B3 Outdoors, buddy. I'd homeschool, but I join with a group of families and send the, the group of kids together to experts. They can learn chemistry from an actual chemist, learn fitness from an actual trainer and so on. I know um, some families that do this in Pennsylvania. And I know one of the teachers that they, they work with. So he does kind of like this micro teaching thing. So he'll, and he teaches actually chemistry and physical science. Um, so the parents just kind of hire him as a, well, he's a licensed teacher and, um, you know, so they, they get together, like, so if it's life science, they'll, they'll get out at a state park and they'll be identifying, you know, plants and things like this and animals and systems and whatever it is. And he'll be pointing out things and, and, you know, botanicals, whatever. And then, um, you know, chemistry, he has some, you know, things too, that they, they do, they, they assemble. I don't know how they, they specifically do that. Like nobody comes like to his place, right. But there's, there's a place that they, they meet. It's usually, you know, public or they, they rent something, uh, temporarily, but yeah. So these kind of micro schools, that's going to be another thing, right. For teachers that this, this whole like days off and burning out teachers are starting to realize, Hey, like I can market myself as a teacher. I can do a micro school type thing, especially if money follows the kids and parents are willing to pay. And, you know, and you could be a teacher then who has, you know, seven or eight students total. And if, if the money starts to follow the student, which in some places that is, instead of going to the school necessarily goes to the student, um, a teacher can make a living off of, uh, off of that and do pretty, pretty well. Right. And, but yes, yeah, so these, are, these are all models that are going to be, be out there. Um, so thanks, um, B3 Outdoors. And hey, here's my children of darkness. So da, da, da. Um, Dirt McGurt, burnout is serious. You need to uh, reprieve from the chaos. You need to reprieve from the chaos. You absolutely do, right? So thanks, Dirt. Um, and it, again, velocity of information and looking at uh, World War II studies, uh, interviewing Clay Martin. Um, when you it's very difficult to return from, from burnout. I mean, it's, that is, um, you know, it can be, it can be lifelong. And so it's that, that fuse before you get to, to burnout, to give people that, that, that exit away from that and to recal activities to, to recalibrate them, um, which is more than just a day off, but you're right. I mean, what people don't realize once you burn, so in World War II, the soldiers that technically would would burn out, and that's the term they would use. They would interview interview soldiers, and they would say, I "Burned out." That's where that term it comes through. It's in literature all over, quotes of, of from soldiers. They wouldn't reintegrate well. Like they would, a lot of them, they do follow up studies, and they would they would say, "Like I never fit well back, you know, in the states, right? I never readjusted to a family and home and things like that." And once you hit that, like that is hard to bring people back if you can from burnout. Um, and especially like you have an educator or, you know, you're over the road driver, whatever you are in your career, if you've burned out in that, it's probably you're done. Like you're probably going somewhere else. Um, brandy and bordellos. So <laughs> I won that bottle of whiskey from, um, um, old humble, old humble, uh, distilling company. So it arrived, uh, a week ago. So that will be for a special occasion. Cause what whiskey only keeps for a short time after you open it. <laughs> so, um, but if you don't open it, it can last what, like a hundred years or something like that. So yeah, have that, that bottle, uh, um, Armitage, I think there's an emphasis on emotions and feelings as it is. We need to go back to just teaching traits. So Armitage, right. Um, especially with the opportunities of like teaching, 3d printing and CAD and things like that. And, and in addition, right in trades, like when I was in, in school, um, it, you know, I learned plumbing and electrical to the point where I was pretty functional. And now if you listen last night, my electrical, it hits limitations, but, um, but yeah, all of these, those things are what gets pushed out when states and the feds say, Hey, like we need to do more, you know, reading level and you need to test for dyslexia and kids need this and, and, and the things that get out of the schedule then, um, are the trades, which is a shame. Like, because as, as Mike Rowe would, would say it's, it's ridiculous. Um, and you know, so around here, if you were, um, 18 years old, right. And you got an apprenticeship with, uh, plumbing, electrical carpenter, 
and and you stuck with it, like you'd be set. I I mean the the amount of work around here is you 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 would be thriving, but also what school funding looks like. Just so you know this, and we talked about this in the classes in fall. School funding puts an emphasis on post secondary, so in most post secondary, as in like university, not trade school, not technical school, which is garbage, right? Like that doesn't make any sense. But there's you're actually supposed to assemble these post secondary plans, which which shade kids into the university systems. And I'm looking at this and saying, this doesn't make sense. And what, what happens if you have a kid who's 18 and, and a kid can go to, there's a big HVAC company not far from us, huge. And they'll be like, you come here to work, we will teach you how to do HVAC. You know, whatever it is, we will teach you, you will pay you the whole time. You'll have, uh, you know, this apprentice on the job stuff. and and you know benefits and and we'll you know you'll enjoy it like we'll actually have meals here you know cafeteria they'll be comped and part of your job thing and um so if you're 18 and you go into that how the school system views that when they report that out is that's that's viewed as a failure that's viewed as a loss people don't know this but it is there's these post-secondary evaluations you're supposed to track students they track them by their social security number right they know what they're doing and and you'll get a report back. People don't know this, right? People, schools get a report back and they're like, oh, you know, like two years afterwards, like this many of your students are at the university, at universities, basically just, they don't tell you what universities are, what students. But if you have a student who leaves and goes to work at this HVAC company, right? And they give a bonus in their training, that student will show up as not being in post-secondary. <laughs> so, which is basically just as binary, like, you're there, you're not. I think there's some indications like for military stuff like that too, but it's basically like a loss when you look at your report. It, it works against you and it's complete garbage. It is absolutely insane. But yeah, people don't know this. The uh, the post-secondary report, it used to drive me nuts as an administrator because I'd be, we had farm, you know, we have big generational family farms around here and some students would get out and they would, they would start being a partner in the farm, right? You know, 300 acre farm and, you know, generational stuff and million dollars worth of machinery and stuff like that. And uh, the way that you're supposed to, you're supposed to then basically have a plan to, oh, like they'd be better off if they got a bachelor's in management from the university, right? Like, so try to encourage this plan. And you look at this and say, this kid has been working deals with, you know, um, uh, you know, sale, you know, product sales and, and, you know, management and, and all of these things, um, their entire life, they know the family business, like their, their family has taught them and they're, they're being brought into this family business. And to interrupt that would be insane. And to also to view that as I should be working, they'll be better off, right? If, if we get them away from here for four years where they would be um, learning these skills and, and taking on this, this passing of the torch, um, no, they'd be better off if they came back with this management degree. No, they wouldn't. They they, have, they wouldn't. <laughs> but again, it counts as an L, and it does. Um, Zippy, that's not what SEL means. Come on. Come on. Who's calling out Zippy? Burnout can have long-term effects. Look at many workers refuse to go back to restaurant jobs. This is from Andrew. It's not because they're lazy. Most of them are just burnout. You're right, Andrew. This isn't laziness. It's not motivation. And that's the studies that I... I reviewed when I was writing School of Errors. It wasn't an issue of motivation. It's kind of like, um, it, it, it what was it, the movie Office Space or whatever, you know. It's not that people weren't motivated. It wasn't that they weren't capable of doing these things. It was it was just that the um, it, there wasn't there wasn't a satisfaction. And also, you know, the interface with the public became very abrasive. And they, they were underpaid and they were realizing it. And so, the, you know, people are burning out and then, you know, they're out of there. Um, Zippy wrote to Moose, I know, I know, but look at the safety industry, hacking, dumb, costly things to school says, I know there's a lot of that stuff out there, guys. Armitage, I'm in high stress job, soldier, uh, police department, fire department. Yeah. In, in, in jobs where you're interfacing on a daily basis with the chance of, um, harm to harm to yourself, right. Or harm to those others around you, which is going to be these jobs. Like I interviewed the Alaskan crab boater, um, Rob Travis and wrote a chapter about him and he was out for like 120 days for in 2003 and 2007, I think. And like every, every day was just like, if you made it through the day, man, that was a win because like all four of his bosses were killed on the boat 
and you know the boat would you know nonstop tilt and dive 40 degrees and these refrigerator sized chunks of ice would go off so like your stress is like you're it's always there and uh you know you get some reprieve when you're below deck but then all of a sudden there's this you know you have to quickly get up and start with a sledgehammer getting ice off the boat for 16 hours so it doesn't get too heavy and sink um moose gal illinois enacted um Illinois House Bill 3249, this creates the Emotional, Emotional, and Social and Emotional Learning Task Force. So I think Wisconsin has has something similar to that, too. So so the thing with this moose, Gal's Corner, is um, so I think there, there's a place for this, right? The, the, the question is going to come up with an educator saying, when am I going to do this, right? When am I going to instruct this and also instruct um, reading and math, right? Where I am being assessed as a teacher. Like you can go online and, and find out how te- students in certain classrooms have performed. So it's kind of like ranking the teachers, right? Even though the students might be coming in and out of class and, and, you know, all this other stuff. But so, um, so I look at this and sometimes I would, I would say at, w- how okay if we enact it then how are we supporting it and are we supplanting anything by enacting this where does it go with our priorities list or is this just adding something in during you know like crowd in like we got to get some stuff off the plate we got to do our schooner tuna um so it's i i i look at that and and again i'm like are we just adding more to the structure are we bolting more onto the ship this is created to develop curriculum and assessment guidelines, best practices, emotional intelligence, and social emotional learning. So a question for that would be like, what is what does that actually mean? Like, what is what does what is a best practice in social and emotional learning? Like I've been an administrator, you know, for 20 years. Like, and I I don't know. I mean, there are certain things, right? You know, that if a if a student has feels that they can go to any adult and and um talk to them right or to report a, a threat of harm to self or others like that that is that conveys that that student has a social faith in the institution and i wrote um i did an independent study like at my doctoral program in that and um so so yeah what do, what do these things actually look like and what is being supplanted when you're adding this into a system where you already have a lot of things going on um so it's, it's good. I mean, you're bringing up the questions, right, that we have to sit down and say, okay, this just got introduced. In Wisconsin, it's Act 86. On December 1st, all schools have to have a link on their website to the state dyslexia handbook. Plus, they have to have links to their district protocols for assessing dyslexia in students and then also how to remediate dyslexia. First of all, like, what is dyslexia is very, it's not very well defined. Um, and you know, is it is it neurological uh, strictly, or is part of this learning style, or you know, what is this? But it's this mandate, right? So suddenly, and I was asked to instruct a class, a three credit class. A district actually got a hold of me and said, "Hey, could you instruct a class?" So you know, we've got a lot of people who are wondering what this is, and so I'm looking at it. And I'm like, "No, <laughs> I am not going to teach. I just I don't know what this where the state is at." And by December first, because they're like, "We don't have it in place. We're not going to have it up on our website." So basically, kind of asking me to come in. I'm like, "That's not my area for one." And you know, it is. So again, it, it's one of these mandates that gets put in. And what does it look like? I mean, how how are you assessing and how are you matching? resources with that and also when you have you're thin on resources and and people leaving um so yeah i've had i've had a lot of discussions about um that with people i talked in my class about i asked i surveyed people you know like administrators listen one how many of you know that this is due december 1st on your website and if it's not you're legally out of compliance and they'd be like um like less than half knew and then, you know, I said, well, are you doing any professional development for this? And maybe like three had some professional development with it. And they're like, well, we think the reading teachers will take the lead on this or maybe the special education. Like they didn't really know. And the state stuff is really vague, but it's out there. So that's the thing where I know my dream is, right, like to to sit down and, and to kind of like to move things off of, of the plate. I just think... Play to your strengths, right? Like play to your strengths. There's a there's a YouTube video, trombone player won it. I don't know who the dude was who who was in it, but um, but anyway, it's 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 this motivational thing. It's like ten minutes long or whatever. 
and it's play to your strengths. And the fact is we don't, we don't teach kids necessarily to play to their strengths and we don't play to our strengths. <laughs> we don't encourage that in educational systems as much too. Like this teacher's like, they're a rock star at this. So like, let's kind of put them at the lead at this. Um, so over here, B3 Outdoors, my mom has a, was a public school teacher for 30 years. So I've experienced teacher burnout. Sorry about that, buddy. Get rid of and reduce homework so teachers can leave at work. Homework is mostly busy work anyway. Yeah, good point, B3, right? Like, um, yeah, it's Jerry Seinfeld. Homework, are you working on your home? But no, it's a good point. My dad was a, a principal for 36 years. And I don't think was ever big in the homework camp. I mean, it was demonstrate in class and... Um, you know, be divergent in how you can demonstrate learning instead of convergent. Like, show me how you you know this. Like, and whether it be through on a chalkboard or a drawing or a diorama or whatever. Now you could have a YouTube video and whatever. I mean, to get kids interest, but um, but yeah, uh, right. This whole thing of of homework. Um, this whole thing of yeah, the the repetition and and uh, you know that stuff it's just it's checked off right. But I mean by by teachers anyway, but the administration wants it right. They they expect that. Um, so yeah, that's a good point. And some schools are pulling back from the whole homework thing. So that's a that's a really good point. Um, Turt wrote it's always, always going to be more struggle and nonsense. So yeah, I <laughs> I, I had to leave school administration because I I couldn't just I couldn't square this stuff anymore. Like I, in my mind, like you know, again, like I said, let's get and really let's get really good at three things. Let's let's do a SWOT analysis: strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. Which is, there, I mean, I teach this in a class how to do a SWOT analysis, and you can find all you know a ton of these on um, in an Google search, you can find a lot of SWOT analysis. People are like, oh my God, like I never knew how to do this. Or I'm like, yeah, it's how to, it's just how to identify what our strengths are. So what what strengths do we want to put resources in to maintain? What are our opportunities, things we can make into strengths? And, you know, what is, what's a, a threat? You know, maybe like here, uh, if we take days off, we're not going to have time for instruction. That's a threat. Okay. So, I mean, but there, there are ways to frame things out. I'm trying to figure out what your priorities are. And again, like if you've got more than three priorities, like three that you're actively working on, it's too many. Um, right now in crowd and behavior, when people are, kids are thinking chaos and, and staff, you got to do the schooner tuna approach, guys. So thank you. Um, man against machine, long haul coming. Um, Armitage, um, dirt. In this case, I'm I probably helpful. Um, or those cases, yep. Um, Zippy to moose. Gal's corner. It's a silly worry. I know it's something the system will have to work out the kinks. Yeah. And the system's going to have to change to survive. I mean, it just is just like, you know, now we have ghost kitchens and, you know, remote work and healthcare that's going to, you know, this whole, this whole thing has to, to change. And like in my state, they also had a bill this fall where they, they wanted um, to require all kids be taught cursive writing. And I was looking at that thing like, what the hell? Like, I don't, I don't cursive write. I cursive write my name. That's it. I mean, how about a bill where every kid knows how to edit a video, right? Because they're probably going to do that. It's going to be um, much more useful for them, whether they're storing, communicating information or whatever. Um, yeah. Or that they, they can schedule, um, you know, in their online calendar and, and stuff like this, that so they can plan out and stuff like that. Like, how about that? Right. Um, it's just, it's not cursive writing for God's sakes. Um, Hey, it's Phil Henry from Germany. Good morning from Germany. I set my alarm, start the day off right with coffee and a good show. Thank you, Phil. Phil is over in Germany. Good friend, Phil Henry. Um, follow his stuff, man. He he's doing everything. Re, um, retooling uh, video game consoles kind of leading the way over there. So thank you, Phil. Uh, Moose Gal Corner, the Emotional Intelligence, Social Emotional Learning Task Force to Create Develop Curriculum Guidelines. Um, thank you. Um, Armitage, that'll be a temporary measure. They'll get co-opt and then they'll work to develop curriculum to make the masses into more progressive slaves. So I, I think the thing, Armitage, so a lot of initiatives, right, how they start and how they end are completely different. And it's not only that they they lose their way um it's it's this turnover and in induction right so again administrators last two years in a school they're gone 
principals, superintendents, two years, that's it. And I wrote about that in School of Airs, the most honest book about the school safety industrial complex. And by the way, if you haven't bought this, my goodness, please consider buying this book. Um, it's 30 bucks, right? I, I, the thing is like on eBay, I think they that's actually more than what it costs if you buy it off of Amazon or places that sell books. Um, but yeah, like, whoa, this is, if you're parents, what is happening for school safety? And then as you can translate this into pandemic safety in schools, this is a great book. It became its own PBS special, um, School of Errors. So, um, but yeah, what, how things, there's turnover. So there is an induction. So you start this, you start a social emotional learning, which, you know, say let's gets passed in Illinois. And then two years from now, 50% of your staff is new. So like if this, how are you inducting them so they understand what this original initiative was and how do they interface with the teachers who were there? And then another two years, like there's more turnover. So unless you have this, this really robust induction system, all this legacy knowledge is lost. And these initiatives kind of exist and you're looking around saying, were you around when this started? Were you around? Tell me about what this looked like two years ago when you did a training on this or the state came in or you hired this person. They're like, well, it was this and I have some handouts, but it gets lost. It gets these, we don't design systems with induction. When I teach my legal classes, I put three things up on the board. Number one is best interest. Legally always act in the best interest of, of yourself and then of your students. Not necessarily that order, but you're acting in, in the best interest. It's a legal term um, and it's always laminated to context and situation. Best interest. The, the second is discretion. Use your professional discretion and make sure those around you know what discretion that they have. For example, you know, if you have a student, do they, can they, do they feel they have discretion to pull the fire alarm if there's smoke or do they feel they have to find an adult before they would do that? So like, what is discretion? And the third is induction. Number three is induction. As people come in, as new students come in, as new staff come in, which is frequent now, how are they being brought up to speed about how we do things around here? Whether it's curriculum, um, social emotional learning, as you were saying, moose caboose, um, or moose, sorry, moose's gal's corner, um, as you were saying, and, and it's like, that isn't there. So people get in and they're like, whoa, like I see all these initiatives, but there isn't any way to bring me up to speed on this. And then that, that really shows quickly. Like if you have too many initiatives, if somebody comes into your district and you have to have like five days just to bring them up to speed on your, your, you know, 41 initiatives, like that's too much. Like they'll be like, sorry, I'm out of here. So that's a good way to, to assess things. Otherwise you have people come in and they just never get in inducted into the system. They're like, I, I'm not sure where I fit, where I'm supposed to carry out these pieces of this stuff. Um, so Bacon wrote, hell, there's now news stories about migrating deer acting as carriers for the, you know what, the bug is never going away. So I saw that. Yeah. And I live in a state with a lot of deer deer hunting season coming up. So is, and pretty soon if they say sandhill cranes, I'm in big trouble because those things are always in my backyard. Um, so Armitage wrote, uh, that'll be temporary measure. They'll get co-opted and then they'll move the curriculum. So yeah, I am, you guys are doing, I mean, you're, it's awesome comments. We have 29 likes tonight and, and I'm, I'm working here uh, through the comments. So thanks. Thanks guys so much. Um, I appreciate this. Um, Zippy to Moose Gals Corner. Sadly, from personal experience, they're are, they are half right. Higher education has become a shell game to get you to bleed out money as a train wreck. If you research it, et cetera, it's not so bad. So, um, yeah, right. Um, again, you know, the, the higher ed system I mean, is fed by the K-12 system. The secondary system, students are supposed to have plans to um, move forward into the post-secondary system. And there's a missing piece in that, right? And the missing piece is, what if you move directly into a company or a trade, which will give you in vivo skills, right? Like by 20, you'll know you'll be an electrician or you'll be an HVAC specialist or whatever. And Or if you move into a family business or some other family business, you know, some other, um, that's kind of not looked at. Um, but yeah. And, and edu yeah, it, <laughs> there, if I, someday I'll actually do this. Like I will go through, my um, transcripts because um, all the years that I was in school in post-secondary and, and I'm going to identify, I'm going to identify, like, I remember this class and then, 
if I, because I bet, I bet there's 40% of the classes I couldn't remember anything from the classes, like anything. Um, and then, you know, I'll, I'm going to go through and I'm going to actually do that and see like which classes, like I remember a lot from like, there are, there's, this, there are a few classes in my mind, like I could probably sit down today and, you know, write pages about what I learned in those classes, but there are other classes I'd be like, what, <laughs> you know, um, NR 395, no idea. I think I know where it was. I think I, I could find, I could find the building where it was. I have no idea what was covered. <laughs> so, I mean, like all of it, but was it required to take it? I guess. So, yeah, I really, I, I think I talked last night or a couple nights ago where I was like teaching, I had to learn how to flint nap in an anthropology required anthropology class. And it, they actually brought in toilet tank tops from Kohler here in Wisconsin. Um, the defective ones. And if, if you would hit those with a, I don't know the hell was it a rock or something you could make flint kind of I, I don't remember it that well I just remember my hands being all cut up and bloody from this process and uh, you know so we're all doing this and I'm like I am what <laughs> like all right I, I kind of get the idea here of like flint and hunting and stuff like I don't have to make my own flint that I and make an arrow and all of this or a spear that I'm going to throw and and I'm like by the way I'm getting hurt while this is happening like this is um. But it, it was it was this weird thing. So yeah, I'm just that's one class I look back and I'm like, why the hell am I doing this? Like, <laughs> this doesn't make any sense. This is crazy. Um, uh, man against masses wrote to Bacon. Hey, Bacon wife and I went out a little country drive yesterday morning looking for deer. Only saw one. Nothing's something is not right around here. So yeah, where I'm at, yeah, I don't I don't know. Um, when I bike, I usually encounter uh, quite a few deer but I haven't been biking because it's like 30 degrees yesterday. Zippy to Moose Gal. Sally from, gosh, I, guys, I love it. I'm having a hard time. I got, like the thing is scrolling back on me, so I'm like clicking where I've already. Scooter Tuna. Sounds like a bedroom move you don't want to be involved in until she showers. Oh, my goodness. So, and dude, it is Schooner Tuna. Schooner Tuna. The tuna with a heart. Um. Every example that's been tried has failed. History disproves it. So thank you, Dirk. Um, higher education, this Zippy has become a process of institutional creep. Um, okay, let me move to, hey, let me move down here a little, little bit here. So, um, Andrew, people aren't falling for any of the lies. So many stories of people going back to work and then quitting on day one when their boss tells them to do the work they didn't put in their job description. That's a good point too. Like I didn't bring that up in my classes, but it would be, that's a good point. Um, it would be fascinating to bring out a job description of a teacher and then to actually have the students look at it or the, the new principals, right? Or going to be aspiring principals and say, is this what your teachers are doing? Is this what you tell them when they hire on? And there's always that other part, other duties as a sign. Are you being transparent with people? Because that's part of, I mean, there's something too, if you tell people like, boy, this is like, we're in some uncharted times right now. Like we're, 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 I'm going to listen. You, we can be innovative and, and, but some of this is going to feel kind of awkward as it does for everybody at this time. Like people will, will respect you for that. Right. And, but no, that's, it's not, it's not how things are conveyed. So, um, Armitage, I got a hot take on this. Since no one has done anything for about a year, I'm going to say no one needs a break. <laughs> so, yeah, these these daily, and so the daily break thing too has has crept into the classrooms, where students are being encouraged to say, "I need a break," and then they go to a lounge or something like this. This is this is pretty common now in the last two years. Well, like okay, but if you're there. What are, how are you actually benefiting from that versus like getting out of class? And what if now a student does that and they're, they're having five hours during the school week where they're in the chilling room, you know, where they're listening to music and playing, a video, which is actually happening in some of these districts. So like you're, you're losing instructional time. So that is supplanting instruction and it just puts the student further behind. I have a friend of mine who's a teacher and he's like, Hey dude, or not dude, he's like, Hey Dave, like, my students are getting more stressed because they come back to me and, and I'm like, you still have this stuff due. Like, you know, we still have these things that we have to cover. Now you're just kind of behind in this. I mean, you can maybe knock off a few assignments, but so and students getting anxious. It's, it's no 
gift to a student to just push things off to the end of the semester and then say, oh, by the way, like all your stuff is due now in two days because I have to get greedy. B3, if I was a teacher, I'd want to be a free agent. Pay me the market value. Anything less, I feel cheated. Anything more, I'd feel like I'm stealing. So it is a free agent market. And that's exactly what the administrators will say. And HR. And if you are in, um, I can tell you, if you're in industrial arts, special education, math, chemistry, speech language, um, you can, that those are all negotiable when you come in. And the, and the districts know it, like the administrators, HR, the boards, they know it. And they would rather have somebody there who might not, you know, five years ago, they probably wouldn't hire if they had five applicants. This wouldn't be the applicant they'd hire. They would have somebody there than have nobody there, right? So they make these deals. And if people come in and say, I want this bonus, like if they can, I mean, this is, this could be a business. Somebody becomes an agent for teachers. I mean, honest to God, we'll probably read about this in the next year. Like somebody who, you know, like a sports agent, right? But I mean, who enters this at a level of saying, yeah, like teachers, uh, superintendents have this. S superintendents do have this. They, they hire these firms to basically get their resumes out there and then to to kind of sell them to, to districts. It's very well known in the superintendent business. Um, but as teachers, you if they you could have this marketed, right? Like um, someone's saying, you know, we're going to have this built into your contract. You know, we're going to negotiate all of these things if you're with me, right? And then you have, it, and because teachers aren't good negotiators typically. So, and it's like, okay, and I will keep um, this 8% bonus or whatever it is kind of like a book agent i don't have a book agent but that's how that, uh, that business kind of works so god guys i mean we're going to be coming back to this show of talking about the day like we we all were discussing and talking about agents for um for teachers i don't i don't think it's it's that ludicrous honestly i think i think we'll see it in the next year someone's going to do this so armitage you can be three outdoors you guys will be starting your own agent business your teacher agent so um, you'd be like Jerry Maguire's. Um, and honestly, though, I, I this could work, right? I mean, it, it could if you had somebody really skilled at negotiating. And the superintendents already do this. Whoa. Um, so let's go down. Oh, it's our good friend, Elephant Armpit. The entire structure of American education is outdated. The world is a very different place now, and we don't really need to run schools like factories anymore. Yeah, you're right on. You're right on, right? Like the the nine hour day and you have to go through this grade to get to this grade and this grade and and you know the whole bell system and all of that i mean which was really built off of the industrial assembly line models you know once schools became the rural schools became consolidated into the the you know local um the, you know the big schools right the rural schools got got shut down the one room school houses so um Let's see here. Bacon. Um, it is relaxing to know 911 dispatcher that answers your call makes less than a Walmart employee. Nearly $5 an hour. I didn't know that, but oh my God. Wow. So, yikes. Yeah. Yeah. Whoa. I mean, this, whoa. Um, tw Andrew, 20% of workers do 80% of the work. Yeah. There, what rule is that? There's a, there's a name for that. Um, that is changing. That's why so many items not on the shelves have long wait times for trade workers to arrive at your house. Yeah. My God, I am happy that um, I don't have any <laughs> maintenance things going on with the house, you know, right now, you know, no, no need for a roof. Um, I was fortunate. We had a washer and dryer that went bad in spring and I went in, you know, when we bought the stuff and I was like, uh, you know, and it was like flying out, um, you know, we got there and they held uh, a GE washer and dryer that, and when the dudes came, and, you know, we were kind of like out of their delivery area. I'm like, listen, like, I will treat you well. Like, here's, you know, I'll tip really well and all this. And just did that because I know, like, there are other people who are going to want these things. And I'm going to be, I'm going to be great to work with. And you're going to have cash. And <laughs> here it is. And yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's, that's the way that things kind of go up. Um, Google Drive, I showed up just then. Yeah, Google Drive. Oh, my God, sassed. I had more problems with that damn thing today. And like, I've been pulling stuff off of my drive and I only use my drive for, um, for my book stuff because I have, you know, people I interview and publishers. So it kind of works pretty well. Uh, my university stuff, because when I'm at the university, 
um, I want to be able to get online and access to try to run a thumb drive into their system is virtually, they don't allow that stuff anymore. Um, and what else do I use it? I don't put pictures on, I never upload, you know, my pictures into like pics, the Google stuff or anything like that. Um, university work book and I don't know, there's one other stuff I, I, but, but basically I don't have that much on there. So I'm, I've been pulling more off because it's like, <laughs> I did like this drive update which they kept prompting, Google kept prompting me to do. And I'm like, it was fine before that. And now like nothing is syncing. The full, oh, the podcast, all of my podcast stuff is in a, is, are in folders up on my drive. So I can easily kind of just, you know, move those, but I don't have anything up there. I guess that I, I really count on that much. And I was talking to one of my friends who's in IT and he's like, yeah, start to pull your stuff off because, you know, there's the stability of these systems and, and kind of like the new versions. He's like, other people are having issues too. And um, I'd be really screwed if I couldn't access some of these things online. So I've been also watching if I've built stuff in a Google doc, like I'm saving it as a word and then downloading it. But uh, I'm in pretty good shape. Like if I, after the work I did today, if I lost my drive, I'd be all right. Um, but yeah. Um, Phil wrote, in Germany, they want to cancel the summer vacation as it would take too much time off school for poor children. No joke. The FAS. Um, one of the news, newspapers postulates that. So, um, wow. But again, I and I think models such as year-round schooling at least need some pilots and some trials. To say, like, this is for poor kids, like, right? That's, you're framing this face validity thing. And it's like, I, I mean, I think for all kids and all teachers there could be benefit I, I don't know who it really benefits to have like this necessarily like a three months of non-instruction time but but yeah this is where you you do the straw man argument of saying oh you know by doing this teaching or, or by by doing this we are benefiting uh disadvantaged students well but you're you're also benefiting um students who are maybe leaping through your academic levels, they can get out sooner of your K-12 traditional system, right? They can get out when they're 16 and, and uh, yeah. So it's all like how you do that, buy Google One. So I, I have it, I pay for it. Um, so they've been helpful. And, but I've been, I've been running, just like in the last week, Dirt, I've run into some issues and I had to like redo the streaming versus mirroring and and it works now, but like I've kind of lost my trust and I was kind of like glad I don't have more stuff cloud-based um, because I'm like, what in the hell is going on here? Yeah, and, and yeah, thankfully, like all my book stuff, at the time I was doing the book, like if I, if I was interviewing somebody, like I would make that chapter available or I'd make the interview available on Google Drive just so they had it. So I could always like listen and tell me, oh, like yeah, there's something to add to this or whatever. And now like I'd be a little it's just not as reliable for me. So, um, which is damn disappointing because like it, it just worked perfect until like this forced update. Like, damn it. Does anyone else in critical thinking test when they were in school have critical thinking tests? I did in elementary. It didn't last long enough though. So how do you problem solve, you know, right? These obscure types of situations. Um, and it's, it's good. Critical. Yeah. Critical thinking. Um, I wrote a, so I showed my students, I showed my students this, um, you can go to FEMA and there's this thing called teen cert, um, in, in it's community emergency response team and FEMA will come to school districts for free and they'll teach kids. Okay. Like your town's just been hit by a tornado or a hurricane or earthquake. Here's how to search for people who are injured. Right. And they take kids out and here's how to plot out an area and how to search it and watch out for electrical wires. Okay. You've just been in a car accident and the car is rolled over. Like, how do you get out? And they'll teach kids, how do you like crib a vehicle and all this. And you would think like, whoa, they do this like free all over. And they'll mention administrators. Like, I have no idea. Like this was even available. I'm like, right. Like this is stuff we should be doing for safety and, and getting kids exposure to how to navigate their environments during uncertain times um, to make them feel like competent, like they can do things. And they're like, how long ago was this? I'm like, this was filmed like three weeks ago in Bemidji, uh, Minnesota. <laughs> I'm like, this is video right here. I'm like, this is, this is stuff happening right now. No one's telling you about it because vendors try to sell you stuff that they can make money on it. Your stuff that's really good. It's free. Um, so let's go to, um, this is John Steele. 
from um, the state of Washington. The safety doc equals sanity in an insane world. Bless you, brother. Hey, thank you. Thank you. And John, by the way, um, school, not school of errors, but the velocity of information, April 15th will be published. And I'll be sending you, my good friend, a signed copy. And John, um, help me out on, I had a section where it was uh, different phases of chaos because a lot of, a lot of people write about chaos is it's binary. It's either happening or not. And I'm like, yeah, it's more complicated than that. And I was, I was trying to come up with like some examples of intermediate chaos. And so I'm like, John, can we like, just kind of talk through some of this? And he came up with some awesome, awesome things. Like it counts, like I had no idea of like, you know, some of these things. I'm like, that's perfect. So like a big thank you. Um, you're not going to see it ex explicitly like cite it John Steele in the book or anything, but the, his, his, uh, his imprint is certainly there on just really helping me on a very tough point out there. So, um, Andrew, Zoom is Skype with groups of people. Zoom is, yeah. B3 Outdoors, uh, the five ways can be summed up as simplify. Yeah, right? I mean, and that's where there is this sense people feel you have to add initiatives. And I probably felt that way as a younger school administrator and just working in schools. Like you always felt like you had to keep adding things. And what, when you, 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 you learn, right, that it's not, you get, good at your priorities you you have to prioritize better and then you work on your like top three and it's those districts and it's those people in your I think your own life like if you sat down and say i'm going to improve these like 28 things about myself i'd be like you're probably not going to do any of those right um but if you say like there's two things i'm going to work on you know one is to be on time and you know one is to work out twice a week or something like that you could probably do those two things right like you could you could do those. So, but you know, these things are unpopular in schools. Like I said, when I was at that administrative retreat and I, and I said, we should have three initiatives and, you know, I was, the room just went cold, you know, it was like in, in ghost adventures when they're like, Oh my goodness. Like it just dropped from 72 to 55 right here all around Dave. It's cold. Like we can see our breath around here. All the batteries, all the devices went dead, all the recording stuff. They're like, Hey, like all the recording, like no one has a record of that. That was just said by somebody in the cabinet that we should have less initiatives. Like that's gone. Yeah, <laughs> it was, it was, it was surreal. Like, honest, I felt like, I felt like people, honestly, felt like people permanently like distanced themselves from me after that meeting. Like they were, and again, I, I, I think there were some people who were like on board, but they couldn't overtly say that or acknowledge that they probably were driving home saying, holy smokes. Like, I'm not crazy. Like, I thought about this initiative trimming thing, consolidating stuff, and Dave actually said it. But no, I'm not jumping on that bandwagon. There's no, <laughs> there's no way, like, I'm going to have that show up in the newspapers that I was, you know, presenting to a school board and saying we should consolidate our initiatives. So let Dave take the fall on that one. So we'll take his office chair when he's gone, which they probably did because I had a nice chair, had a lot of nice office furniture. I'm sure that all got, like parceled out <laughs> like there were claims probably on my my stapler and file cabinets like well before it was gone um so yeah um phil wrote, i guess there's a biological reason people get sick sitting in front of a screen six plus hours the brain can only take so much attention before it shuts out that's the work of linda stone continuous partial attention um and again you know like this was i'm, I'm gonna spell continuous wrong here so um, gosh, tension. And then let me do this. Linda, if you just type these together, they'll kind of come up. Right. I mean, it, it makes sense. And just physically, you know, to, to move and, um, but yeah, it's, so maybe like this is my, uh, Zuckerberg, like the metaverse, it will just be walking around and everything will be there. But, um, so, all right. So we, we have, um, 30, um, thumbs up. So thank you, everybody. And I am burning through these. Um, um, oh, where we go here. So I am burning through um, the comments, which are great, by the way. So I love these. So yeah, if you can subscribe, thumbs up, tell people hey, about the show. I'm getting, I'd love to be at a thousand subscribers in April when the show or not when the show, when the book releases, I would love to be at a thousand subscribers. Um, and it means it's important for me too with marketing and things like that to say, hey, like I've had some 
more frequent shows, you know, things are starting to grow. Like they, they're tuning into that. All Pro Lemonton said, Zoom has become, let's have a meeting about him. It is. Yeah. And that's what Linda said too. Like, and, and I, I, I just ran into this today where someone's like, hey, can we do like this meeting? I'm like, can we just do a call? <laughs> like, do we have to do this as a, as a face to face? Um, you know, and then, oh, a phone call. Yeah, I suppose. Um, so yeah, I'm like, it's, you know, phone call. Um, shelter in paradise. Thank you. A four minute phone call can resolve a 20 minute email conversation. You're right. And this is, this is where leadership comes into play. And this is also in schools of saying, Hey, like don't abandon the phone call, you know, versus the phone call home. And, you know, you can, you can make a, a little entry of, you know, if you're or a phone call with a colleague or something like this, I mean, people feel like they have to do an email and then tag everybody in an email and stuff like that. I'm like, do not do that. I tell my students, I said, you know, here's the deal. Like you can email me, right? That's fine. And I will email back. If it's going to be a long email, just email me saying, um, what are some times we can talk? <laughs> because then you can have up on the screen in front of you, the course stuff, right? And we can simultaneously, I can kind of walk you through like, because everything I do, even though I teach in person, there's a Moodle component or, you know, I can answer things. And and I'll say like, do not tech. I said, you can text me a, a, a question, which is kind of a yes or no. Is this due on Friday? Do I have to submit this um, before class or something like that? Yeah. And, and how many pages? Two pages. Two pages, 12 font, <laughs> not eight font, two pages. Um, but do I, I don't text fast and I'm not going to, I'm not going to write you back, you know, a page response in a text. So here's my number. Just call or just text and say, hey, what's a good time to call? And yeah, and if I can't, if we can't get things resolved in four minutes, that's crazy. Um, the final exam in my one class, and I did this last year, I changed things up first time, is it's it's all done by phone. People sign up for times and they have 20 minutes and we have five questions we go through. And I said, just talk to me as if I'm a member of your school board and I've, I've got these five, what is your induction process for new staff? How do you determine your top three priority? And they, so they know ahead of time, you know, I don't, and I'm like, you don't have to do any, don't send me any handouts. We're not doing this in Zoom. I don't need you to throw up a PowerPoint. And I had somebody, honestly, and I, this was a great student, right? Um, and, but did this PowerPoint with like a lot of slides and I'm like, okay, like that, I understand what you're saying, but if you're presenting that to a board or people, like they're just going to be overwhelmed by that. So just, you know, and, and I'm just telling people, just be real, be real. Um, I'm going to ask you some questions as we go through. Nothing to worry about with this. You know, you've got it. But at 20 minutes, we're done. So, like, be concise in your points, and I'll ask you some follow-ups. And people be like, this is the greatest ever. Like, no one's done this before. Like, I felt this is valuable because, right, I'm usually um, having to assemble a PowerPoint and present to people and do this type of stuff and, and you know, all this stuff. I said, no, you know, this this, I, this is what I want you to do when you are actually in your, and I'll ask you questions like, tell me about best interest in your school safety drills. Like, so it's a question you've had out there. What's, you know, tell me, tell me some ways you're going to increase best interest. Well, you know, we're going to put, if I'm an administrator, I want to, I want to have measurable objectives. I want to know how our two-way radios, if people use them correctly, or they know where they are, if they can go from building the building or something. I'm like, okay, cool. Like that's an objective. Like that's best interest of your drill to learn how your communications work. Okay. And then how about your students? And they'll be like, um, for, you know, our younger kids, let's bring in our firefighters and, you know, kind of in their gear or EMS and get kids familiar with the ambulance. So if a kid has a seizure on a playground and, you know, EMS is here that other kids aren't freaking out, I'm like, okay, that's good. It's best interest, right? It's exposure and, um, to, to understand that, you know, when, when emergency responders are coming not to be, not to be afraid. So, so it's really the, these great things. Like I walked, I had a call from one of my, my uh, superintendents who was in one of my classes that had this really bizarre situation going on in a district with the uh, kind of built facilities. Right. And he called, he called me up and he's like, can we, can we talk through this? Cause I've never had a deal with this before. And so I'm like, yeah, totally. So we like stepped through all of these things and what your, your priorities and public relations, all this stuff. And, Again, you know, it, it, it's it's not getting it's not getting lost in um, you know all of the things that that can just kind of consume you. Um, shelter in place every holiday, um, 
five days of work in four days. Yeah. And that, and shelter in paradise. So that, that's what I talked about at the beginning of the show. When and these are unexpected days that these districts like North Carolina, when they came in on Friday, November 12th, you know, they just told teachers that week, Hey, you're getting November 12th off. And, you know, so it's like, okay, but like we still have the work to do. Right. And, and this wasn't part of the schedule. Um, so dirt, McGirt, dirt, McGirt, uh, long holiday weekend, do little to follow the load. Yeah. The work is still there. Right. <laughs> it's just like, think of anything, you know, um, the farmer who takes a day or two off. I mean, the farm animals are still there. Now they're hungry. And, um, you know, the, the crops and I mean, just exiting from these things, they're still there. You still have to do it. Now you have less time to do it. Um, dirt, uh, Zippy wrote to dirt, uh, fighting for nearly 50 years in the mental health clinic was more about meds than therapy. I feel just, uh, bulldogging things. I found some balance. So I'm glad to hear that. Sorry about the interfaces you've had with the systems. If you sorry about that, um, stay strong friend. Um, the will to be better is stronger than the complacency they have. So and Zippy does really cool stuff. Uh, he's a very creative guy. He's, he's, <laughs> I'll tell you, um, I got, I got a hold of him before I was teaching these fall classes and I'm like, uh, I said, I know, you know, a lot Zippy about, um, intellectual property. Uh, he's, he studies, he's very aware of it. And I said, can you kind of point me in some examples and some tutorials that I can share with, um, in my classes, because I know you're really into this and boom, like he put together a really nice curated document for me. So thank you, buddy. I appreciate that. Um, so, so Marty or Martin wrote, uh, as a property taxpayer, a school board levies to build a new school that went unused for a year. I voted that down the last levy. Holy smokes. So, um, yeah. And, and, you know, the, the thing is with these referendums are passing like crazy. Like 80% of building referendums in my state have passed in the last five years. And it used to be, you know, kind of that 50, 50 split. And, and now they're, they're, if you put a referendum out there and there's like buzzwords, like if you can tie it to school safety or to HVAC improvement and stuff like that, like people will vote for it. Um, so I've always, I was always like a really good steward of dollars. And I just say like, I, I when I see some of these referendums go and they're building these big buildings when students are being less in the building and they're also building these massive sport complexes with jumbotrons. Like there is a school 40 miles from me that has a jumbotron, which is the third largest in our state. And we have the Badgers and the Packers here. It's the third largest jumbotron in the state is at their high school football field that just opened. And I'm like, how in the hell, like, you know, how, how do you, how do you justify this? Um, so let me, let me uh, go down Marty to dirt material. Yeah. The taxpayers aren't going to put up with this uh, slacking. So I, I think, uh, I mean, the tax bills are going to be coming in. Right. And what is wh right. What is going to happen um, when mill rates, like, you know, property taxes, house values go up. So property taxes correspondingly go up and, um, but there needs, there'll be some point where there'll be some defaults on some of these things and, and how will the difference be made up on that? Um, so I think actual physical school building structures that have been approved, um, haven't been conservative. Um, you know, for example, you know, like using, you know, very fancy architecture and things like this, um, when without doing that, you could still do a very a very functional appropriate building um but but you know all of these like i said these these extras get in it's no longer when you pass a referendum in, in schools it's no longer you're building a football field right you're building an artificial turf <laughs> field with a management team to go with it and jumbotrons and sky boxes at your football fields which is is happening you know like holy smokes one of the trains of thought in dynamic testing this is from zippy homeroom system I've been uh, staying with. If you max out your general skill, then you could focus on personal skill and vice versa. So thanks, Zippy. Um, Elf and Armpit. Um, California getting rid of talented and gifted. I thought it was uh, CA anyway. So I think you're right. Is it California? I think it's also maybe New York is doing this. And um, California also got rid of physical education because they 
the argument was um, some some students felt ashamed of uh, you know their um, body positivity, I guess, during physical fitness. And I, I'm looking at that saying, whoa, like this. But are you as, actually asking, or students with disabilities, it's unfair to put them in physical fitness. Are you actually asking these students? Because I don't think that's what the students are telling you. I don't think the students, especially in California, are saying, I don't want to participate in physical fitness. But um, yeah, oh, it's a shame. Yeah, the talented and, and, and gifted. And these are the things which are going to just undermine um, the validity of, of school systems. These are really bad decisions. Armitage. Now, with that, so I'll say there's there was one superintendent in my class this fall, and he had a small district, and one of his focuses was to get students college credit in high school students, and he had this phenomenal level, like in our state of 421 districts, it was like the fifth highest district of having, so if you graduate, you already have, have like two years of college credit earned. So kudos. I mean, thinking like that really goes down the, you know, that's something that really entices get students like, oh, like I'm only, I'm halfway through like a college thing and I'm taking courses and I'm getting to visit the college campus. Armitage, when I went to college the first time, I was legitimately about learning. Second time when I went back for engineering, it was so different. The emphasis had shifted completely. So yeah, um, that's, let us know like the time frames on that, on that too. Whoa. Um, Bacon, this reminds me of my last year in high school going to continuation one. They give you Credits based on set amounts of work done made up over two years worth in just the time. Okay. Zippy, I was college level in fourth grade in 8889, a year after they damaged me to the point where I could not read. Oh, sorry about that, buddy. That's again the I think, right? Modules like and <laughs> this whole thing of the grade level stuff is part of the burnout. I mean, I think if you gave teachers the opportunity to also teach in modules, um, that would be kind of exciting, right? You'd see, you'd see this transitive process a little faster, maybe with some students. Um, so I think, I think it's all there. Um, so let's, uh, let's kind of get, Hey, it's DLD. So right here, what's up, uh, Brotato chip. Oh, <laughs> it is dark dark after dark. So I appreciate it, buddy. Um, so yeah, we're having a good chat here on Docs 5 things. So I will have a, a blog post. That's one of the cool things, right? So if you do listen, listen to the show, you participate, right? On safetyphd.com, which is underneath here. But um, if you go up tomorrow, I will have this in a blog post, which will be, if you know, about 700 words. So about a three to five minute read. And I do that for every show. So all 158 shows have a, a blog post. Um, and I'll render this in audio so you can go on Podbean and it's linked out under the, the things. So, you, you know, if you're driving and you're like, Hey, like I got a long trip, I'm going to visit bacon in, uh, we're going to stop over in Inglewood and, uh, I'm going to download some podcasts like this will get you across the, the country. Somebody once, um, uh, somebody emailed me and said it was a school, a school safety coordinator, maybe like Texas or I don't know, but. The guy emailed me and then he said, by the way, like I've listened to every show you've done. And that was like when I did 130 shows and I was, and it was like 200 hours worth of stuff. I'm like, really? <laughs> and he's like, so he was like noting like things from certain episodes. I'm like, I guess you have. So I had somebody once who listened to my shows and outlined several of them and sent them to me and just said, here, like these outlines might help you when you talk and reference these shows. And they like put in hours of time, hours of time sent me file after file after file. And I'd be like, God, I don't even remember. Like, I don't remember all these details, right? Like, it's like, you know, if you're, if you're being interviewed, like, Hey, like, you know, when you were on, on that episode of Star Trek, you know, or whatever, um, well in this scene, like what happened? You're like, I, I don't, <laughs> I don't remember, man. Like I play a scene back. I can, I might be able to tell you. Um, I'm like, that's why the blog post is out there and things. I see, you know, I, I kind of got other things going on, but these people would just like f get so finite, which it was, which was cool. Or they'd ask me some, some question where I'd have to be like, I'm not, I'm not really sure. Like, what did you, what did you mean when you talked about like this at this point of, you know, one hour, eight minutes in your podcast, and I'd have to go back and listen to it. I don't know. <laughs> or I would be like, I think this is kind of it. So, um, that was always, that was always some funny stuff. Um, so Marty wrote, um, sorry, Marty, Martin, hope you're not, hope you're okay with Marty. Um, 
kids complaining about screen time doesn't make sense when they spend eight hours playing Minecraft. It's true. Like my daughter is like roadblocks, Minecraft, all of that stuff, just nonstop too much. Um, and you're right. So the, the screen time thing is, it, and the, there's something to be, be recognized there. Like when I, when I would do the stuff of saying, Hey, like we're going to do the, the mining museum, like go down inside the mine, or we're going to do like the ancient Egypt thing or whatever, these online or tour, like there was a submarine you could tour, um, like a submarine museum and you could, you, you know, so those are some cool things. Like, um, so like the, you know, they would like, should be like, it was, wait a second, like going over here and going over here and we'll go up this ladder and then you could go on this train and stuff like that. So, um, so yeah, that's a good point, Marty, because you can say, well, this is too much. But then like at the same time, the kid's like, okay, I'm done with this. And then they like go and they're playing Roblox you know, for four hours straight, <laughs> the Mountain Dew and a slice of pizza. Uh, modular was the word I was looking for in the homeroom system, modular. So um, uh, DLD after dark wrote, won't they eventually switch to indoctrination levels K-12? So, um, man, I don't, I just, I think K, K-12 again, as I said, is, has become so many initiatives, it's initiative overload and then it's delivery mode overload, virtual and hybrid and in-person, um, that it's, it's just thinning out right now. Uh, when you talk about the indoctrination, which is a term like, I don't, I won't tend to use a lot because of, of the work I do, but, but I will, you know, DLD, um, say, I mentioned it before that there's a big emphasis on, for high school kids to go to college and, and, and school districts get a report a year or two out. Like here's your graduating class of 2020. Here's how many are in college right now. But what's missing is here's how many are doing internships or here's the person that started um, a YouTube channel and they're making $8,000 a month. I mean, like, honestly, like those types of things are just like, if it's not in this, very distinct lanes of post-secondary education and mostly university, not so much trade. It's, it's just not acknowledged. And I looked at that and said, this is wrong. Like this, this doesn't make sense, right? It, this is clearly showing a preference to post-secondary. Like you are, you're basically lining up their, their roster, their, their recruiting class is what you're doing. And you're, you're kind of making it, if, if you don't do this path, then something's wrong with you, right? I don't go for that at all, but you're right. DLD, you're, you're, you're picking up on it, buddy. Um, Martin, that's seriously disturbing. Um, so, Hey, let's go over here to, um, inner Jedi X. All right. Welcome. Welcome over here. And if you haven't subscribed to the show, thank you. Subscribing. We're up to 30 likes already. I love this. This is so also like I'm looking and I'm, I'm growing in the number of hours. I think you have to have like 4,000 hours of unique viewer time plus like a thousand um, subscribers to be monetized. And not that the show would ever like go crazy monetized, but it is this marker, right? Of I think credibility and getting to reach more people and, and more people aware of like a good content. Like I, if you go into these 158 shows, there's some pretty cool stuff there, including this. Um, uh, dirt wrote, lithium is seriously insanely toxic. Not proof for anyone below 18. Uh, dirt. When I was an administrator, there was a there was a doctor prescribed lithium for a kid in elementary school. This kid came to school. This is absolutely absolutely true. The kid came to school, and he he looked gray. He looked his his skin. He looked gray, and he was walking down the hallway to his locker, and he passed out. And the nurse um, had to like do CPR and like call the doctor or you know call the ambulance and stuff. And the thing was. They, so, you know, they took the kid in and, and, um, and then they talked to the, the kids, the kid's doctor, the nurse immediately, you know, after the kid was gone the, and the kid was okay after that, but the doctor just said, well, it was real defensive. Like, this is my decision. And, and she's like, I just want you, you know, I want you to know, like this, this kid came in and the mom said that she administered the medication this morning and he looked, you know, he passed out here with symptoms and stuff like that. And he's on his way to the hospital and the doctor was like, Hey, I don't want to, I don't want to deal with it. And so then, you know, we had this whole thing of like, Oh my God. And, and so this whole thing too, the parents like, well, I'm still going to follow what the doctor is saying. Cause that's a doctor. And I'm like, the kid almost died. Like he walks to school. Like if he, this would have happened two blocks away. I mean, it could have, it's, it's weird things. Um, 
So, wow. So, wait. All right. It's a good friend, DLD. And uh, Martin, Zippy, do you think we should get rid of Chalkboard Charlie and let Nintendo teach school lessons? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, DLD. Anyone um, that's in here from DLD, give me a PWEDC. So, all right, buddy. Uh, and thank you. Thank you, Dark. Dark has really, <laughs> he's done so much to promote this show. And then also the Friday morning version, which is face validity Friday is nine o'clock um, AM central time. Just uh, thank you, buddy. Because like uh, just out of the blue, like you've been very generous to this channel and to me um, helping more people become aware of the work that I've been doing for a long time. Uh, so that, that means a lot. And you also, you run a very good show. Like you're a very good host. So I appreciate, you know, when I, I see your channel on live and so SAS wrote, um, ha ha ha, public education is a great thing to, oh, SAS too many. So, or SAS one too many, by the way, SAS one too many, where's, I forget, SAS one too many is going to be a guest on the show. Uh, so we've been, been uh, working that out. So if you're going to learn more than just his cannonball run antics, where he tries to drive 200 miles an hour from work to home. So you can, yeah, you can really chop time off a 20 minute drive when you're, when you're doing that. Um, but yeah, so, but no, there's, there's SAS has a, a fascinating story to tell about, um, face validity in, in the media, but over this, this long perspective, like years, and then also some other things that'll come into it. He's a great, he's a great guy. I've, I've seen him a couple of times on shows and I'm like, I think, I think SAS would be great to have on as a guest. So, um, so I'm looking forward to that and just, as you guys see that, it'll come up not, in not too long. It's asked one too many. He's going to be a guest on the show. Marty, if I could work, um, it could work if the study focus is there, but not all kids are captivated by the same thing. Sippy, so. Here's a thanks, y'all, from DLD. So Armitage, and I can't, I can't see how many people are viewing. Like, it hasn't gone from, like, 11 to, like, 3,900. So, <laughs> but it's this show, like, is almost done. Um, that seems still the case. When I got back from Kuwait, this is Armitage, realized the place I was from didn't exist anymore. I think there's a strong argument that I I never became normal again. So Armitage, um, yeah, sort of hear sort of hear that, buddy. And the work, you know, I, I have a neighbor in back of me, and uh he he is a F work uh, served in Afghanistan and Iraq, and the guy's like 10 years younger than I am. And, you know, when he, when he came back from serving and you know, we were talking and stuff, it was just, oh man, it was, I could just sense the struggles he was having to, to, I don't know if it's readjust or reacclimate or, or the things that he experienced that he would, he would guardingly share, you know, with, with me and, and things. I don't know. It just, it felt really bad. And to this day, like, let me try to help him out whenever I can. Um, you know, and just listen and, and just kind of do nice things. Right. Like, um, but, but, oh yeah, I, I can sense it. I'm like, Oh God, I'm like, I'm, I'm thankful for what everything like, you know, you've done your, your service and your hard work. And I'm really like, I can see, um, the days are, you know, there's struggles there for you, buddy. Um, so this is to moose from bacon. Um, Assessed one too many may just be pointing out that public school is a government program, which as it is inherent, is there to serve itself. It's not, uh, he's not trying to offend you, I think. So, um, yeah. And again, I'm an, I'm an educator. I teach that. I'm, and I'm, I'm saying, I think there are, there are definitely things to, to do this. The system is in this, in this rut and, um, if it doesn't, if it doesn't innovate, um, it's not going to, it's not, it's not going to last. It just, it just won't happen. Um, and a lot of that is, is these political structures that have been put in place. Um, so DLD is saying to a dirt, um, I'm here for you, bud. You ever want to rub each other's back? Mostly clothes is normal. So that's why you wear sport coats. Um, government, public, interchangeable. So uh, Martin wrote, you know how many young engineers I have to teach how to use a wrench? Righty, tighty, lefty, loosey. Yes. I know that when I put the uh, trailer on my car. 
That is stuff you should learn at the age of 10. So Martin, it's great you mentioned this because that is exactly what the new principals tell me, right? They're, they're, or the principals tell me um, about their new staff to be like, how did how to get the baseline of reading for a student like to 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 figure out and so like it's called running records and things like that. I mean stuff you you learn redundantly through K twelve education. You should be able to sit down with most students and be able to figure out you're reading a third grade level, which means like if I, here here are books that you would likely be able to read. Like these these wouldn't be above your difficulty level yet. There's enough in here to keep you interested, not too easy. Like that's pretty basic stuff and to have people come out now and be like, I have no, I have no idea how to do this. So like, show me how to do this or like which books match to this or like, as you is, how do you do a running record and, and all of these things? I mean, in, in the business, like these are all things, these are slam dunks. Like you should have these down. Um, and, and they're just, they're not, um, they're not doing it. Um, Dirt McGirt, it's sad how clueless people have become. So I think, so you're going to enjoy my book, The Velocity of Information, right? It's coming out. But in, in The Velocity of Information, you know, it's this whole thing too about awareness, right? It's, it's so much about um, the indicators and also knowing the, kind of where the masses are moving and where you're moving and, and in relation to everything. Um, so, yeah, um, I think I think it's a validation. Um, and also it's not it's not hopeless there's some really great stories um, in there, some great accounts like Juan Brown, you know, who was basically the, the reporter of the Oroville Dam crisis in 2017. And the guy's not an engineer. I mean, he's an airline pilot. And just how he kind of took over and did the reporting and basically, you know, kept millions of people informed <laughs> and probably led to that being handled arguably quicker and more efficiently than it would have if it wouldn't have been covered by this citizen as journalist. Um, but, um, DLD wrote, Hey, damn Armitage, that's some deep shit. Um, so right here, we lost monetization, but we're not up to a thousand subscribers yet. What up, Martin? Um, and Martin DLD after dark, Marty. So guys, thanks for the uh, 30 thumbs up and for following the show and for telling other people or following from your three other accounts. <laughs> like, and again, I am, I am, uh, if you, if you do, this is, it's in libraries, a lot of libraries too. Your library can get it. Um, I'm, I'm not, but this book, School of Errors is, if you're a parent, man, this is, this is necessary reading. This is a good Christmas gift. If you have friends that are parents, right? You're like, Hey, like read this book. Like this is going, you're going to think about things a lot differently as a parent, um, as a taxpayer and just things like it's, it's really well done. Um, and leave a review. Because I think there's only 44 on Amazon, and by goodness, like <laughs> there needs to be more because I know there's a hell of a lot more than 44 books that sold out there. So, um, yeah, one of the biggest things you can do for to help somebody with book stuff is is reviews. It's like one of the biggest things a publishing house looks at is reviews. And thankfully, you know, the 44 um, are out there. So uh, true that um, bacon. I'm not sure if they could ride a bicycle, but they are proficient in computer programming. So as long as they don't have Google Drive, right? Armitage, when I left, it was a town of 400 called Berthound. Um, when I came back, there were thousands of people and they renamed it Broomfield. They even tore all the original buildings down. That sucks. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, yeah. You know, I go back to my hometown once in a while because family still lives there. And now it's like it kind of industrialized. And there's a McDonald's and a subway. You know, like and I grew up, there was like some small family owned the pizza place and they'd make a sub for you too. Like, but you know, it was in this old building on main street next to where the train used to go through. And, and now, yeah, I'm like, you know, there's a subway and a McDonald's. This is, there's this modernization, which has happened throughout the town, um, which is, is just really strange. Um, it doesn't, and it, I, it's a thing too, like, cause I, I don't go there very often. So when I go there, I'm like, Holy smokes, like this has changed a lot. I mean, when I grew up, like, my friends and I would get together. We go fishing until you'd hear the fire whistle at noon. If you didn't have a watch on, you'd hear the fire whistle. So it'd be noon. So you'd go home, grab something, you can go fishing again. And we would hang out underneath. There's a bridge, there's a river through town. This is steel bridge with cross beams, you know, that was built in the 30s and that's been torn down and replaced modern. But 
you'd sit underneath the bridge and you'd fish. And it was great. And there's a swinging bridge. So you could go back and forth. And and I'm like, oh, God, it's good. I'm glad I grew up when I did. I, I'm, I'm so glad I grew up, um, you know, in the 70s and 80s. My God. Um, yeah. Um, Marty to Bacon. Not sure if they could ride a bicycle. Oh, guys, sorry here. I don't know. I've got, I've got this weird... Um, weird thing here where it keeps going back. So elephant, the most important thing a teacher can do is teach students to think critically. You're right. Elephant armpit, right? And that's what I talk about in the velocity of information. Information is so fast. You know, the velocity is information, it, velocity is speed in a direction to you, right? Um, you have to critically think, does this make sense? So my Friday is face validity Friday. It's a thing. You have a thermometer in front of you and you're standing outside shivering. Like I was last night on the track. And the thermometer says it's 85 degrees. And you're like, there's no way in hell it's 85 degrees. I'm shivering. It's snowing out here. Like, this doesn't make sense. Well, this is the official measurement machine. It says 85 degrees. Well, that thing's broke. Or else, like, I'm delusional. One of the two. But there's no way in hell it's 85 degrees out here. That's face validity. And the fact is, people don't do the face validity checks. They, they just take things and say, oh, okay, that's what it is, right? So the critical thinking is you said elephant um, armpit right on. Um, you're right there, buddy. Uh, bro, I feel you. My mine too dirt. I'm the youngest of five, and we were all heels. So, come on. You're you're probably a pretty cool back in your time. Cool now, right? So, uh, so Zippy wrote, "I'm um, dyslexia is magic is magic ma <laughs> dyslexia, right? Like holy smokes here. Dyslexia is magic works by reversing letters and information, words, definitions, meanings. It brings new meaning to the words backwards. Laugh out loud. So." That was hard for me to get through. Um, <laughs> cursive writing is a very good thing. I'm not against getting rid of it. Okay. So, so yeah, so moose gals. Um, so this this is a debate happening right now in my state. And I would say, how do we prioritize, right? If if we're going to teach cursive writing, or it has to happen at third grade, or something like that, what are the things that we want on a curriculum map of scope and sequence to be taught at third grade? or fourth grade or elementary or whatever, where does this fit in? And then how do we, I mean, this is where the burnout happens, right? Because teachers will say, well, I have to do this and this and this by the state. And we're getting tested on this and there'll be a cursive assessment and I don't have enough time. And plus now we have mental health days where I have less time to do things that I'm tested on and I'm scored on and I'm evaluated on as a teacher and I'm ranked. So if I go to another district, they'll look and say, oh, you have like out of four, you're ranked a uh, 2.9 because of your, the way your students performed on assessments, like that stuff happens. Like you can, in some states, you can now go in and, and there's this, this ranking of teachers based upon student performance, which sounds crazy, right? Because of the variables that go into that. But Marty put, uh, you have to teach cursive writing so kids be able to read the constitution. <laughs> there you go, Marty. That's the argument for it. There you go. So, you know, one thing weird with cursive writing for me is like, I can sign my name and it's never identical. It's not even close to identical two times. So I'd be the dude, like if I ever was in pro sports and they're like, Hey, like, you know, Dave signed, you know, baseballs or, you know, whatever it is, football, like every signature would, they, they'd bring in, like, it would be what on, um, um, pawn stars. They'd be like, here's here. It's signed by, you know, doc pro and here, this ball he threw out it. And they look at it and they look at these handwriting samples. And every time I write, it's different. Like you can't, it looks like it's different people writing it. So I'd be like, I don't know. <laughs> My best offer here, uh, buck 50. And that includes the case. So right here, Pawn Stars, right here. Chumley, buck 50. Best I can, best I can do. I'm like, really? Buck 50? I signed it. He's like, I don't know. You Maybe you did. It's hard to say. But the picture of you signing it? I'm like, no. Say, so, yeah, I don't know, buck 50. Take it or leave it. Store credit. So, um, DLD, I always, I always thought the T in SWAT stood for trends. Did you? Maybe it does. Maybe I got it wrong. <laughs> if I have it wrong, I've taught it, I've taught it wrong for 10 years. Honest to God, if I find that out dark, um, <laughs> I'm going to be. <laughs> so there was one thing like I, I presented on, on, um, on a certain policy and I was very positional on it the way that I present it to, to students on this one policy. And then like this year I just changed. I said, the way I've been teaching this for 15 years, like I'm, I think like this doesn't apply anymore. So like, here's the way it should be taught now. 
they're like holy smokes like so god maybe it is trends i mean honestly like trends would make more sense than threats i think because in in trend and trends you'd have to evaluate your environment and face validity to what is happening and not only the whole thing of they said it's the i observed would be trends so if i think you're you're on actually when i that's an assignment for my spring class i might change it to trends so so well dark look at that look at you've impacted the syllabus for 655 for god's sakes so i'll send the rest of it to you you can update it get it to me um december 1st because i gotta start kind of building it and stuff like that just stuff like this man where you're this, this is good stuff you're you got it i appreciate it um so phil henry is getting good at face validity yeah sass wrote hey thanks buddy yeah and and phil sends me mail he'll be like i took this picture at the grocery store today and like most of the stuff is gone or like yeah i took this so he'll he'll, he'll say like what are you hearing in the news in america and then i'll be like this is what i'm hearing about whatever and he'll, he'll take a picture to kind of match like what it, what is going on in germany so I always think Phil kind of lives on the edge a little bit. Like, like there's some day I'm I'm not ever going to be able to communicate with him again. Like you're gonna Phil's Phil's gonna be he knows too much. That's the thing. Um, so I'm sometimes I'm like, dude, are are you is this okay? Like you know, you 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 could take a picture of a grocery store like that's ninety percent empty and send a picture of it over to the U.S. <laughs> I don't know. So, but don't put yourself at risk here for the safety doc. Um, so. Yeah, I didn't. I don't know. B three outdoors. Uh, teach personal finance. How to change a tire. Gun safety. How to edit a video. Practical skills. Um, used to be taught by parents, but that's not the case anymore. Yeah, these are great things, right? Personal finance. God, there was a time when schools had like these stock clubs, you know, where you could go in and set up accounts for free, like with Yahoo and stuff, and, and they would teach you like how to trade stocks and or maybe you want to have part of your portfolio and CDs and stuff. And I don't know where, where that went. That wasn't that was in modern technology. That was like 10, 15 years ago. How to change a tire, right? And and that's where this I talked about where that that time FEMA type class comes in, uh, gun safety. I talked about it in here. Like gun safety happened in my school on the fourth floor with you know other classmates um who brought you know you just had your brought in your guns you kept them in the office for the day and then you went down and got them when it was gun safety time and the instructor came in um but yeah how to change how to change how to edit a video so that's the that's the point you know i was bringing up with my students and i said where do you if, if you're testifying to the state assembly and you're about the cursive bill i mean i would say instead of cursive Maybe every student needs to be taught how to edit a video um, because it isn't this ancillary thing anymore. It's a, it's a communicative tool. It's the way that we convey information, competency. For some people, it's a livelihood. Um, you know, this this thing of to say, I mean, I and probably many of us know, I mean, I know people who make their livings or could make, they make enough off of social media and influencing, but also through um, beyond just the the media part of it, but you know, like product reviews and or or tutorial type videos and stuff like that, where they they make enough to live on. Um, so yeah, and it's kind of interesting too. Like I used to have a, a 2007 Buick LaCrosse, which was destroyed in a car accident. <laughs> it was real sad. It's the best car I ever owned. Damn it, but. Um, but to change a headlight on the thing was just hell. Like it was a weird headlight configuration. And then I think I think I read somewhere like the the engineers changed part of the engine after the headlights were in, like the mounts or stuff. So like there's less room for the headlights and like the headlight engineers are like, what the hell? You're like, <laughs> we wouldn't have designed it this way if you're gonna mess with the other stuff. But um so like these things are hard to change out. So I went on YouTube and I found like four videos, and every video the person starts on there, like, listen. You probably own a 2005 to 2008 Buick LaCrosse, and you, this is why you're watching this. And yes, this is a, this is a nasty, right? But we're going to step you through it step by step on how to do it. And here's like you're going to need this, and you're going to need this, and this is probably like a problem you're going to run into, so don't freak out. And then like you know, and and I watch these videos, and then yeah, so I'd have the phone out there, and I would do a couple steps, da -da -da, watch the rest of it, da -da -da, watch the rest of it, da -da -da, and I. Yeah, change it out little little tips and tricks like you have to pull this under if you put pressure over here to move this. So, who would have thought like that would have been the thing? You know, like you could go on 
how to change your headlight on a 2007 Buick LaCrosse and watch like four people who do videos of it. So, um, Phil Henry, Sass one too many. Thanks. All right. So Phil is still with us. Um, yes, I haven't kicked down his door yet. Um, they'd just kick him down and say, Hey, we want you to leave us. You're a smart guy. You're a good guy. eBay is a scam for books. So it's, yeah, my, it's, it's weird. Like, because my, whoever is trying to sell my book on eBay, well, they obviously haven't bought it and stocked up, but they're just trying to like order it and then like sell it for a profit. Like it's not going to work. Um, so let's get back. Uh, man, this is crazy. Elf and armpit. That's why I'm trying to enter the teaching force. I think, and I plan to, to bring it laugh aloud. So elf and armpit is an awesome uh, guy. He's an outstanding, um, educator. So you, you are, you've got the vision buddy. So, um, and there's others, right? It's, but, but yeah, um, I would, if you were my teacher, man, I, you know, like in, in school and the creativity and stuff like it'd be, that'd be awesome. It's, it's not just, again, those teachers, it's these systems that kind of, they get all barnacly. So you, you've got to operate within these systems, but, um, shelter and paradise to the bacon. It's hard for teachers to grade critical thinking. It is because it's kind of abstract. And how do you do it? Do you do a rubric for it? Like, what does it really look like? Um, and again, you're not getting tested on it. So. You, you get these state report cards for your school district and everybody knows that the realtors know what their marketing house is saying. Hey, look at this. This building has a B rating or a green rating and this building has a yellow rating. And so like, if you're not testing on it, you're not going to teach it. That's why school safety goes in the tank. Right. I talked about this on PBS. I'm like, no one gets tested on school safety drills. So, you know, they're all over the place, right? There's no inter reliability. liability. Um, there's no incentive to do that. Uh, so this is uh, Shelter in Paradise again. We were just informed this is how schools are rated. So sorry about that. Uh, Dirt at Safe Jack, fully appreciate you giving us this info from your educational background. So, oh, thank you. I'm, um, yeah, so 25 years. My dad was an administrator for 36 um, in the K-8 setting. So actually, um, <laughs> when they retired, my mom and dad, they built a house, which is one block away from the school where he taught. So he looks out the window, he still sees it down there. It's been added onto a few times, but, um, but yeah, I mean, so I, yeah, my 25 years and, and then continuing, you know, to teach my uh, graduate courses in this, but again, these so things that are critical, like this is an important show because you're going to see ABC news with David Muir teacher burnout crisis in America and teachers taking day off for mental health. It's like, okay, but what's beyond that? Um, and is a day off really doing anybody any good or is it actually, you know, bringing more disruption and, and harm to the system? Um, what's a root cause? That's a direct response. That's not a, that's, that's, that's not a root cause solution. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, like I, I wrote about, I wrote this article about the Notre Dame Cathedral fire. And it got published in a Crisis Response Journal. This is a great article. I wrote it like two days after the fire, and I said, you know, the the whole thing here is like, you, you got to figure what what's a root cause of of the situation? Because the direct cause, I don't even know, you know what the direct cause is. Like, was it a spark from work or a cigarette or something or electrical malfunction? Who the hell knows? But the deal was like when they went up. And initially investigated the fire alarms, you know, right in, in the in the rafters. They didn't go up and down the rafters. They just kind of looked from one corner, like way down. And they're like, oh, no, it looks good. Well, that's a that's a root cause problem. That's a procedural problem. Like every time you get up there, you should you should walk from one side to the other, and you should have a flashlight and maybe like infrared detector, like you know. FLIR. So you should be able to go around and you could detect any hot spots immediately. Um, but to do that observation versus, uh, you know, the machine, you know, the, the thing just probably is off. So that's this whole thing of like, it's a mentality. Like that's a, the root cause failure right there was this whole procedural thing of just half assing and of not going from one side of the rafters to the other where you would have found what was happening. So that really, I don't know. I had some other issues with that. It didn't turn out very, very positively for me. Um, so dark road, I have a serious problem with this works where we are um, conditioning our children to say, stop, I need a break. I feel like he, when I want to pressure, it's teaching them 
to run from discomfort and growth. So I think I think that's a that's a keen observation, um, Dark. And it's one of these things where like the cracked board of Clay Martin, it makes sense, you know, bef- to have a fuse before you burn out. But when you do this too often and too early in the process, which you're saying, and, and I also mentioned it where schools do these, these um, relaxation rooms, they call it. And students can, like my daughter, my both my daughters have this in their school. They can just go any reason into the chill out room. And it's like, that's not the way life works. Not just work, right? But that's not the way life works. Like if, um, you know, a storm is coming into your area or you're, you're driving on the road and the weather is deteriorating or like, you know, somebody has a, a medical condition that's progressive that they get diagnosed with, with your family. Like you, you have to understand coping skills. Like you have to understand this whole simulated annealing I talked about in um, school of errors, like where you're at, what your options are, and then how to progress from those. And yes, there will be points in, in where you'll get to a burn, a, a fuse breaking point. And then you'll you'll move on, but but we've moved that fuse way up the line, right? And this is a thing too. So in philosophy of information, like um, today, 30 percent of people. So I'm like, hey, Dark, what's the capital of Connecticut? And you're like, hey, Dave, just a second, I'll look it up. So it can be anything, and people immediately. It doesn't matter what the question is. Um, is it, maybe it's something that they should they should know, right? It's it's uh, and something they don't have to, to, to look up and they'll, they'll just immediately go and offload. They'll, they'll try to look this, this up on the net instead of like trying to memorize or trying to, to like, you know, think through things or how would you do this? Like problem solving stuff. And like, well, let me, let me see like a YouTube video of someone doing this. Well, how would you do it right now with the stuff in front of you? Like, I don't like, tell me like, what's, what do you think? I mean, and, but yeah, it's moving, it's being moved up. And if you, if you have this thing where you, as soon as you get challenged with rigor or something where you feel uncomfortable and you disengage from it, um, you don't know how to function in chaos, right? So that's the, th- I wrote it and that's extensively in school of errors where a hundred years ago, and I present on PBS about this too, hundred years ago, kid had a three mile roam range, three miles, um, you know, Hey, and they'd be out in the woods playing whatever, and then get dark, they come home. And then, progressively like the next generation smaller roam range and then like it got down to the end of the block and today it's like basically from your bedroom to your couch you know playing video game and metaverse and stuff like this um and so these kids aren't interacting with their environment and they're not being stressed with it. they don't and, and it kind of overwhelms them when they get out into the environments now um like we had a new playground put in town and first of all everything is like four feet off the ground you know nothing like when i was in my playground was like built in the thirties, like in my town. And it was like an old blacktop and it had a draft. It was like four stories tall. If it fell off, it broke your leg and stuff like that. And it was crazy, but it's man, was that a wild playground as a kid. And honest to God, they built a playground in my town and they have boards with directions on how to play on these different things. Here's, here's a, here's a swingy raft thing. Here's how to play. Here's like a view of two people, or you can pretend you're, I'm like, Holy smokes. And it's all this narrative Then the kid's supposed to. And then there's also um, a QR code so that the parent can scan and then they can also tell their kid ways to interact with the playground equipment. I'm not lying on this. This is authentic. And I'm just like, I, you know, you could put 10 sticks and a cardboard box out there and the kids would figure out how to make a fort <laughs> and how to do whatever out of it. I mean, this is so weird. Um, I'm just like, this is, it really makes me feel, it, and of course the kids don't want to partake in that. Like, right. They don't need, they can look at this and say, all right, I've got this figured out. <laughs> and if they, you know, they'll come up with their own games and stuff. But I mean, it's just this, it's just weird. Um, oh man, I don't know. That is, that is just weird. So, um, Dark road, it, it could trick them to think they have issues that they actually don't have, like anxiety, depression, or other issues, and it's making them weak. Um, I think if so, this brings up. I think if you were to ask people or ask kids, what is what? If you were actually to interview them, like to sit down with them, and I would do this after we would do fire drills and shooter drills, tornado drills, or like, um, what did uh, was did you understand what to do when you heard the 
horn beep or whatever. Um, if somebody was new here, like what should they know? Was there anything? How did it make you feel? Um, were you scared? Were you like, okay, I'm excited. I know what to do here. Um, tell me, how would you say you you felt? Um, and, and you let kids like kind of, you know, have that discussion. But, but yeah, like this, it, I, you're right. I mean, we don't really give kids a vocabulary to talk about things or else we kind of feed them with a vocabulary and just say, pick from which one of these it is. And they're like, it's none of those. The hell's wrong with you? <laughs> um, and and to run from discomfort and growth. I mean, out of discomfort comes growth. I mean, if you have a if you have a, a a book that you're reading as a kid, right? And it's and there are some words in it that you don't know, and you have to kind of finet, you have to find out from the context what this word might mean, or maybe you got to look up a couple words. Some teachers, their parents, or institutions, or whatever, will look at that and say that's that book's too hard for that kid, right? But it's appropriate. Like there should be rigor. There should be challenge. There's a learning process. There's using the context to figure out what your what this might mean, right? That's normal. But we've we've made it where once if a kid experiences rigor or challenge, like we've portrayed that as failure. Like we should always make things so they don't have to feel rigor or challenge. Um, and we you know we've paved over that and. I've seen that. I mean, I've seen I've seen people actually say that. Like, if we've hit the rigor point and and they feel challenged, they're going to be frustrated and they're never going to want to do this again. I'm like, that's gen generalization, and, and also it's just not accurate, right? <laughs> um, it's not accurate for any of us. Um, of course, we have something that you're like, this is way too hard. Like, I don't get get any of this. Like, that's going to be frustrating. But there's also this sense of accomplishment of like, hey, like it, you know, I did this. Whether it be that or some physical fitness activity, something in FIAD class or building or whatever it is. Um, it's like, you know, so, um, elephant, uh, scooter is a sailboat <laughs> scooter on the rock river. Marty, I had 10 minutes to get to my next class. Five minutes was probably avoiding a, a tap in the hallway. Man, I lived in, I not lived in, I, I had one of my, um, in my elementary school, like that thing was was a hundred years old when I went to it, and then it was built onto four times, and to get from one end to the other, like <laughs> you had to be you had to be hauling. But back then, I mean, was, you could really you could really fly. Um, so Zippy wrote to Armitage, working in three D, it is all the rage mid late nineties. It's what some call working with your hands. It may have been a random collage psychology thing, but processing three D was a the theme. Yeah, there used to be that thing like hands-on learning, right? And I don't, I don't really hear that anymore. Um, yeah, the whole tactile, the whole tactile sh uh, stuff. So, um, yeah, yeah. Let me scroll down here. Um, so, Moose Gal, Shelter in Paradise for what? Oh, sorry, Moose Moose Gal's Corner trading options. So that'd be like stock stuff, how to trade. Um, but when it when it there was, I, I thought we were, we were close at one point. I remember these stock clubs um, in schools. And then I, in addition, it was stocks, bonds, stuff like that. And I did, it's weird because that, that kind of vanished. Like you would think there'd be like a state competition team almost on that. I'm not joking with this. You know, like you have FBLA and other clubs. Like you think, um, you think there by this time would be a finance club. And, you, you know, your portfolio and maybe you could, you know, have parts of portfolio, whether it be, you know, a crypto or stocks or bonds or, you know, whatever it be or a fixed investment. But like, it's weird that that's not a team that's not there because I, it seemed like that was emerging about 15 years ago. There were clubs like that. I remember that in schools and um, that it wouldn't be, you know, you wouldn't have banks and stuff like sponsoring these schools and you would have different teams, you know, kind of like the debate teams. I don't think it's that wacky of an idea at all. Like I don't, um, I don't, know. maybe it is, maybe you're like, what in the world? Um, so, all right, let me kind of get down to, um, so, okay. So Sastro, the docs podcast can be found here. So thank you. So that is, that's pot. Yeah. The Podbean. So everything on audio on Podbean, then everything is on video on YouTube on this channel. And then the Podbean stuff is all leveled. So, well, I mean, except like, like the first 10 videos, <laughs> the first 10 shows where I'm kind of, you know, was recorded with little 
hand re handheld recorders and stuff like that. And um, but then, you know, I, then I learned how to level and stuff. So that's the difference between this show is if you're just listening, right, don't download this and rip it to an MP3. Actually go there and just download the MP3 because I run everything through a leveler. Um, and I don't add commercials and stuff like that. So um, that's cool. Thanks for sharing that, Sast. Um, NDP he seems okay as long as they end PlayStation 2. Then the kids won't be seeing his eye getting fat <laughs> and won't need the PE. So, yeah. Oh, my God. Um, virtual field trips. I kind of talked about you know some of that stuff with my daughter, but I mean, we're, we're schools will, instead of actually having an opportunity, for example, to you know go outside and do geocaching. My God, here's another thing. I remember this was a this was a big thing when I was teaching my classes a couple of years ago, maybe like five years ago. Schools saying geocaching, um, so kids would get out there with. Um, remember that that whole what was it? Um, I can't think about it. the Japanese little characters where you'd go and you try to find them with your phone. They would just show up. But anyway, you would have these geocaching activities and the kids loved it. They felt, you know, like little kind of like pirates, you know, they're finding stuff that were stashed out and then they're learning coordinates and distance and location and exploring their environment or even stuff around school. That was big. That was taking off. I remember kids in classes and they loved doing the geocache thing. And then it just, these are the weird things where it's like, that was good. Kids loved it and it's gone. <laughs> and if you reintroduced it today, geocaching, kids would still love that. Like who, I mean, that would, that would be enticing for kids. Um, and you don't like that's gone. Stock stuff is gone. It's kind of weird. I didn't even think about it until I did the show of like, I'm like, there are some really good things that just never, well, they don't catch traction, right? Because you don't test geocaching, situational awareness, environmental awareness. You don't test that. So, you know, sorry. Um, elephant armpit. As soon as the term screen time became prevalent, everyone, students and teachers started clinging to it as a top concern when in reality it was probably used more to get out of doing work. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, Sass put, the doc will announce it when the time comes. It's something specifically that I lived through. So um, it's Sass um, being on my show. So yeah, Sass and I are working out a... Um, an outline. There's so much that could be be covered. He's a really fascinating guy. So and now I probably can't share it in Google Drive because that's all gone to hell for me. So, <laughs> but yeah. So I'll do. Um, yeah, when we do the the lead up, you know, there'll be there'll be in the show description, you know, things that we're going to into cover. So that's that's where I get to do my my interview uh, skills. So um, I still want to do a show, and I will sometime. When I did my doctoral uh, defense down at UW Madison, um, I got destroyed. So um, my doc my team walked out <laughs> like 15 minutes in, and eventually, like I defend, I, it's it wasn't the quality of the dissertation or my research or anything like that. Um, it was a really bizarre experience. So that'll be a show. Like I'll just I'll tell you it, how that process worked, um, and and how it was just this bizarre day and. I kind of got my lunch handed to me, but I think there was more to it. Um, so I still am a big fan of UW and anything. It was, it was just a really weird experience. <laughs> it was, was kind of like, what What just happened there? Put it on replay. Um, that, one, that one should have been videotaped, so I got to watch that back and analyze it. What, what just happened here? It was down by, it was down 42 to zero, like three minutes into the first quarter. And like, I was, I was, the bench was empty. I was like, "What? What is happening here? Throw, throw the the red flag to challenge this." Um, it was bad. School safety drills when I was a kid. This armitage was just stop and roll. Kind of gave the impression that we spent a lot of time on fire as adults. Yeah, it's and the, the fire drill stuff is kind of weird because like I put that in a PBS show where fires. You know, 1958 we had Our Lady of Angels fire in Chicago. 92 students, three nuns died. But since then, you know, we just don't typically have school fires, right? I mean, it's very rare, but you'll still have a lot of fire drills. Now you're having some intruder drills and in weather. But there's sometimes, you know, I'm looking at this and I put that in PBS. I said, like, this part in my state, the southern part of the state, pretty high frequency of tornadoes from April into September. So I'm like, there should be additional tornado drills because, like, here's 
I, you know, this is well mapped out. This is where, you know, the Great Lakes and this is, a, you know, these patterns. So they should do a little more tornado drills. Like let the science, the science of tornado drills, like where the tornadoes are striking, kind of inform that versus just, yeah, we don't, we, don't, we, we probably don't need to do, you know, eight fire drills a year anymore. Um, so I had, this is true. Guys, this is going to be sad. I had, um, I had an administrator and good, good guy. And he said, you know, um, it was during this last year during the pandemic, you know, schools are coming, was, you know, schools are coming back in the session and he was doing a safety drill. And he's like, so like I sat around with my administrators and we try to figure out how to do um, a fire drill. So, and he's like, so they, so they did like socially distance fire drill. And I'm like, so I'm just kind of, I'm like, oh God. So after class, and he could tell like, my face kind of lost expression and he's like, Oh God. And so after class, you know, we talk and I said, I, I get it. Right. I get it. And you're a smart guy. And, but right. Like this doesn't make any sense. Right. You would never would. Why would you practice a socially distant fire drill? Like I get the whole overlay of the pan. Everybody does. Right. But this doesn't make sense. Like, no, don't do this. Like, um, Absolutely. In this, you know, they had this thing where then the principals were saying, okay, like we'll line up and everybody will be so many feet away. And then they'll, they'll say like, go. And then like student goes out and after they get like six steps out, go. So I'm like, you know, a drill that took you two minutes and eight seconds now takes you eight minutes and two seconds. So just like, that doesn't make sense, but I understand the pressure to do that. Right. I understand the pressure, the scrutiny of people around. And that's where you have to stand up as a, as a leader and face validity Face validity should be your first thing telling you, this doesn't make sense though, right? Like if there's a fire, we wouldn't do it this way. But yeah, politically and conveying to parents, this is why you're doing it this way. Like you're trying to shape everything so it's now conforming to a pandemic informed environment, I guess. And so, but it's just so wrong, right? It's it's just absolutely wrong. Um, but again, you know, that was one of those things, you know, we, just afterward, and he he was realizing it, and I said, yeah, it's, it's a learning experience, right? But this is one of those things of like, why, you know, why would you, <laughs> you would never do it this way, right? This would never be the way you'd actually run a fire drill. Um, bacon boards with directions how to play, and we wonder where these enter exit one way things only came from. Yeah. Oh man, that's crazy. I was going to take a picture of that and put it in my uh, book in School of Airs, but I didn't because. Um, yeah, that's, I don't, you know, stuff is might be proprietary and publisher probably wouldn't be thrilled on that. Um, Armitage, if you don't face challenges, then you end up demanding free stuff later in life because getting it for yourself might be hard. So I think that you're, you're right on with that. There is a, there's a struggle and I don't want to put, I don't want to frame struggle out as it, it, it would be inhumane to watch somebody um, perpetually struggle and to not try to give them the tools to, to move through the struggle and, and to advance. Right. But there's also this, this inhumanity of re removing anytime the struggle gets near them to move them away from that and not let them encounter and, and grow in this whole process of simulated annealing or understanding your options and making decisions. And then once you have made decisions, you have new options and make decisions. Um, that doesn't help anybody out. Pokemon Go. Oh God, you got it, elephant uh, armpit. Yeah, Pokemon Go was a was a was a you know part of that trend. Not kind of in that geocaching type area, but geocaching was had much more built into it. You know, like you um, you could measure distance from things, and you could map out where you where you got things, and you had to interface with your devices and longitude, latitude, and distance. I mean, all this. Uh, so, um, elephant row, I still use geocaching. Yeah. They love it. See, and this should be, um, we should be highlighting these things in instruction and, and teaching as teaching tools. Cause you could probably sit down and, and write up 10 ways that this is, it could be brought into teaching curriculum skills, you know, from mathematics to, um, to reading, to communication. And students have to have uh, technology skills, right? By eighth grade, at least in our state, to demonstrate some basic thing. I mean, all of these things could come into that. And then somehow how you wrap this into supporting 
assessments because no one is assessing geocaching, which is, again, this is always the shame in education is this is the type of thing like, you know, GPS, you're out hunting, you're out in, in the woods, like hiking. If you're geocaching, you know how to, you know, coordinate GPS and understand GPS type stuff, or you might be able to also understand directions in north, south, and compass, or if you know, all this. so makes sense, man. Um, Elfenar put, well, it's great to have layers of protection as opposed to hoping one thing works absolutely. Armitage, absolutely agree. You don't want to watch someone flounder around, but you definitely want to give them an opportunity to overcome up obstacles if only uh, that they can sometimes. So yeah, that's, it's a big, it's a big thing. And I'm, um, and I'm always championing for that. And, and yet like, you know, the people will say, well, if they're, if they're hitting frustration, we're failing. I'm like, no, 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 no. Right. That's, that's wrong. Um, if they're frustration is where learning happens, the interface of frustration, if you're perpetually at the frustration level, yeah, then you're not accomplishing anything, but you it's, we've sold people, we've sold educators, we've sold parents and the media and just whatever, like that. If you hit frustration, that's failure. And I don't agree with that. And I just completely think it's, it's wrong. So, um, true. The adage for racing in regards to the controls, you don't want to crash the birdie, but you also don't want it to get away. So yeah, bacon. Thanks buddy. All right. Well guys, here's the dealio from your good friend, the safety docio. So <laughs> I, um, I'm going to have to end up buying the paid version of StreamYard because um, this has been a great show. It's three hours and 25 minutes after I said I'd do an hour and a half. But I enjoyed this. I really did. Thank you. So thanks for the thumbs up. Uh, thanks for the subscribes and for sharing the show, sharing the channel. That's, um, you know, I'm near 600 subscribers, which is up over 100 in the last 20 days. I'm hoping to get toward 1,000. Um, this is good stuff, right? So, like, we've all had a good level of, of um, very very thoughtful interaction in the chat and um yeah so friday morning at 9 a.m is the show face validity fridays and that's going to be a regular with me so face validity fridays friday at 9 a.m yeah basically i'm you know, pulling out some headlines and things and saying here's what it says here's what doc sees so like what do you see by you is, is you know is this does this make sense this is face validity um so, um, so yeah, thank you so much, um, for tuning in here to the safety doc and I am going to, uh, to sign out. Well, wait, it's Armitage. I'm def definitely interested. So let me put that down here. Thanks Armitage. So, um, 9 a.m. CST Friday. Um, so it's the same channel here. Face validity. I've got so I've got the microphone above the keyboard and hitting. Um, as I type. So it's well, I just spell validity wrong, but it's face validity Fridays, and so that's where I work ahead of time and I'm pulling from different sources of either some articles or some studies or things like that, and then we just throw it out there, and I'm like, what do you think here? Does this make sense from face a face validity? And again, that face validity is so important. Um, it's a thermometer that reads 85 degrees in the middle of a snowstorm. And you're like, this thing is not working or like, I'm not processing this correctly. One of those two is happening. Um, so what, what's really going on? What is the eye observed? Um, yeah, again, and that is so important. And I teach that to, you know, my students, we, we exercise that as a family, um, I expect that, you know, out of my kids, Hey, don't tell me what they said. Like, let's talk about what I observed. And once you model that too, other people do that. You, the way you incorporate things and the way that you carry yourself and the language that you use and saying like, I observed, um, and people notice that. And for example, a velocity of information, I promise you when that book comes out in April, you will, you will read that book. Um, and there will be things you will incorporate and not everything will be like new for you, right? You already have stuff, but it'll be, there'll be ways in there where you'll, you'll do things differently. You'll see things differently. You'll say things, you'll behave differently. People will look to you and they'll be like, yeah, like I'm, I'm picking up what they're doing. Like, I like that. I'm going to, and I'm going to shape some of the things I'm doing after that. Like uh, some 
indicators in my environment, some situational awareness or like the crack board or, you know, the, um, the attention thing or attention, I didn't, you know, attention is serial, right? So one thing to another, it just doesn't expand. It just kind of fades out to static. If you do that, you start talking, there's this concept wet bulbs in there, which, which I describe it's once I talk about it in, in this, I'll start talking about the book more when it gets closer, you'll start using these things and people are going to be like, damn it. Like, do you know that Arm Arm Armitage was doing a lot of face validity stuff and, um, and like, that makes sense. Like that dude is, that's, he's the face validity dude. El Elephant armpit, you know, was, was talking about, um, uh, the wet bulb effect, you know, of how just as, as this information is coming out or it's negative vicarious rehearsal stuff, he's talking about how people like tend to believe like everything is affecting them, even if it's 500 miles away. So then like, here's how to interface with them. Like that dude is, I, that, that was a pretty cool discussion with that dude. So be like, yeah. And then he was telling me about the rock river and all the sunken schooners. And it'd be, then you'd be like, whoa, like that's a benefit. That's even extra. So 85 degrees during a snowstorm, pull your thermometer out of the bonfire. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, that is, that is funny. Um, I'm so I'm, we are, um, so it's obviously the middle of November. Cause I assume that November 15th for me is the same as it is for everybody out there at the moment. <laughs> um, and I'm just like, I'm just floored that it is, we're entering quickly in Wisconsin here winter. Um, and I've been like, just pretending it doesn't exist. Like, you know, cause a couple of weeks ago, it was still 70 and it's be 50 tomorrow. And that'd probably be the last day we'll have it 50. But, um, I've just been unwilling to acknowledge it this year. I'm doing a stare down with winter of being like, stay away. I am, I'm old man who likes warm weather and does not like slippery, snowy outside anymore. Like it's not for me. And, uh, yeah. So, um, all right. Well, everybody, this has been an awesome night. Um, I really uh, love it. Uh, appreciate the chat. Thanks for the 31 thumbs up um, and for the support of the channel. Yeah, and like, I actually feel, I feel so invigorated, like when I get done with these shows and, and, you know, I'll listen to this again and I'll, I'll, I'll check out the chat and the things that I missed. So not intentional, right? <laughs> I just I'm trying to keep up here. Um, but yeah, I, I just, I'm so thankful. So, Oh, and as, um, as DLD would say, be kind to people, you know, um, share a smile, uh, with people, be kind, uh, help out. You never know the way that you interface with somebody in that day. You might be the best, um, you know, the best thing. Like I said, there's this, there's this, when I do a walk, there's this car that has a bumper sticker and, and it says, and the bumper sticker says, I hope something good happens to you today. And then every time I get to that car and yeah, I'm just going to walk in like, that's just, it's a cool cool thing, right? Like let's just bumper sticker on a car, but it's a cool thing actually to, to think and to, to tell somebody and be happy. Like when somebody has success. So, um, so Armitage, thanks for streaming. Lots of good insights. Thank you, buddy. And thanks for coming over here and supporting the channel and being new. Um, as many thumbs up as Baskin Robbins flavors of ice cream. Really? <laughs> That's absolutely hilarious. Our work here is done. Um, thanks for coming folks to doc. Really? I do. I do. Yeah. And, and I'm, and you will be, uh, blessed to have uh, sassed um, on the show where I will be interviewing him and, and it will be informed by, um, yeah, he's, he's a great guy. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, Sass to me, what they said, thank you guys. And um, yeah, so this show is like partially will be guest and I'm going to be bringing in a former NFL player. Who's a friend of mine who played, I think seven seasons in the NFL. Um, and he's going to, he's going to talk about two things. So the first is, I can't give out his name yet and, and things. Um, but he's going to, um, he's going to talk about what it was like when he got in the NFL, because uh, there were a lot of things like they tell you when you're, you, know, you draft it and you come into a team, like you they tell your parents, your family to get insurance liability because people know you have a lot of money. You get drafted in the NFL and they, they go to your parents and suddenly they slip on their sidewalk and they get hurt. So he's going to talk about these things that they teach, they induct you right in the NFL that no one ever knows about. They never talk about. And then the other question is like, when do you know how to call it a career? Because I mean, he, like I said, he was still in his twenties when he retired and it was obviously most of it is physical stuff. Like, you know, things happen and it's just it's kind of the point where you won't be able to rehab. 
but um, how do you know, like, how do you know, like to, to stop, like, what are, where does it become? Um, and then how do you make that transition when you're still relatively well, we're young? Right. I guess there's three questions. So I lied. So I already set him up. He'll be like, you told me you had two questions, Dave, but he's going to, he's, he's going to talk about those things. Um, and he's a great guy. So he's a family guy. I think it's, I believe six kids. Um, so, you know, he's, he's loving, um, and he, he's been, he's been out of the league for about uh, 10 years now, but, uh, but yeah, I, I said, I want, I want you to come on and talk about, yeah, that, that safety when you initially come in and also when you, how that process is when it's like, okay, I'm, I'm done. So, um, a lot of people don't know this, but Bacon actually played a uh, three seasons for LA Rams. Um, yeah, was a slot receiver and, uh, had a, a was 111 catches um, for 2,028 yards, uh, but no touchdowns. Not his fault. They never threw to him in the red zone. He was like the guy was lightning between the the 20s, and uh, so yeah. But it was awesome. I mean, he yeah. So it was bacon. Um, so I don't know if you know him. Maybe he'll sign a football for you, a helmet. But yeah, so. Bacon. So Ellie Rams. All right. Well, everybody, uh, thank you. And this is the safety doc and I'm going to do the, the end here. So appreciate it guys. Uh, so yeah, bacon. All right, guys, take care. Safety doc.